I think the, the, the whole dream and the pride of being capitalistic and, you know, building things you're proud of that are going to last and employing families and that, that whole rah, rah is getting chipped away at by modern cultural factors. And to me, it's saddening. And it's a big part of why anyone cares to hear, although we may speak our mind more often than the world wants to hear, but it's part of what made America great were innovations and risk taking and new ideas and trying and creating and manufacturing. Welcome to Oil and Whiskey, an Ironclad Original. I am Josh Henning. I'm Phil Gerber. I'm Jeremy Gerber. Welcome back to Oil and Whiskey, an Ironclad Original, presented by Blade HQ. Whether you're into cars, motorcycles, hunting, fishing, grilling, or any number of things, you've got the tools that you swear by. Have you ever noticed that you, the tool you swear by always happens to be a knife? I've noticed that, yeah. and it always is. Always, always shows up. Do you have the knife that you swear by? If not, it's time you got yourself one. And Blade HQ is the place to get it. They've got the knives to fit any hand, any belt, any job, and any budget. Just go to bladehq.com slash oil and whiskey to shop their selection of knives. Today's guest is Jonathan Ward, the founder of TLC and Icon, the world-leading sources of restored and modified classic Toyota Land Cruisers. Founded in 1996, TLC creates restored Land Cruisers and has become partners and consultants with Toyota, even creating the prototype for what would become the 2007 FJ Cruiser. Icon specializes in many custom models, including the Icon FJ, based on vintage Toyota Land Cruisers, the Icon TR, based on classic Chevy pickups, the Icon BR, based on classic Broncos, and more. To learn more about his businesses, TLC and Icon, check out their websites, TLC 4 x 4 4 x 4 for those not in the know, .com, and icon4x4.com. Also follow them on Instagram at TLC4x4 and at icon4x4. Jonathan Ward, welcome to Oil & Whiskey. Why, thank you, fine sirs. Good afternoon to you. And good afternoon to you. Before good afternoon, we get, man. Before we get into anything, we came into the podcast studio this afternoon. To a surprise. With, to a surprise package sitting on the table. Yeah, I think you, it's it time. Is. It says, "Do not open until start of podcast," and this is the start of the podcast. All right. Well, to it's good timing. So, I listened to uh, some of your previous episodes with uh, a couple people I admire and a couple more people that I'm proud to call friends. And uh, of course, you have a nice blade handy. I, I could have expected that as you un open that You've box. Got to. But, you know, considering I didn't get a care package from you guys, and the title of the darn podcast is Oil and Whiskey. I mean, obviously, we have oil in our bloods, but I wanted to make sure you gentlemen were properly lubricated with my favorite single moss, Cowila. No offense to your sponsor, potentially. And I took the time to uh, hand make you guys, uh, all, th all three, actually, uh, custom icon flasks. Uh, Oh. Old traditional analog leather craft is a big passion of mine and finds its way in all my projects. So oh. I uh, and dyed and stitched and fabbed up these nifty little Dude, flasks. For look at that. Man. You went above man. and beyond, man. That's awesome. That's well, you know, like you guys fantastic. with all our projects, you do it once, do it right. There's enough crap in the world, so <laughs> everything should be done this, to the proper, fullest extent. This is really awesome. I've, I've got a... Uh, I've got your signature here too. So, well, I don't know what these are going for on eBay, but I'm going to check it up <laughs> after the <laughs> show for sure. <laughs> my uh, leather craft hustle, uh, I've oh, man, pretty much is... overwhelmed my wife and friends Super uh, cool. with stuff. So, I, I have started a little side hustle. I am, I've been selling stuff sort of old school on the side hustle uh, via my uh, Instagram feed. So, so cheers to you gentlemen, even cheers, though it is man. only. 3 p.m. on the West Coast. I'm going to call this. <laughs> Cheers. Join Absolutely. In. So I, I have uh, my own bottle you? of the same spirit, and uh, we'll do a little cheers and get this party started. Sounds good. Cheers. Man, I'm upset I'm not uh, slacking the shop for this. Slice that open, we. Right? That's what yeah, you get. Yeah, you missed out, Phil. Where You're sitting over there with those palm trees in the background, but we're drinking this 12-year uh, single malt scotch, so. And yeah, we're not feeling bad for you, but... No. Uh, where where are you, Phil? I'm uh, Florida Keys. Figured someone's got to be on vacation, so I might as well step up and uh, play that guy for this week. Well played. 
Thank you. A, these yeah. flasks are really cool. Yeah. You guys are, you guys are probably just going to eBay mine before I get home, right? <laughs> Man, you're not going to believe what happened. <laughs> One got damaged in shipping. <laughs> Whoopsies. Uh, so how the uh, I mean we can jump around and we'll get we'll get to the origin story here in a second. How the leather work kind of come about? It's just all from the mind of this singular lunatic. I've always been artistic, shall we say, and I've dived into pre-Raphaelite painting, constructive, deconstructive marble sculpting, uh, fine woodwork, furniture making, leather craft, apparel design. And frankly, like what drove me into transportation design was that all these singular little niches of craftsmanship that I really appreciate and some I'm capable of. Otherwise, I've you know got a community of friends that are expert in them. What better than a cool, unique ride to be the cohesive, extroverted communication tool like platform that ties so many different arts together in, in, in one package, right? So, you know, you, you get to bring in the woodwork and the leather and the color theory and materials and, and all that different stuff. It all comes together. So that's what got me started. That's awesome. Yeah, it's neat stuff. I mean, I've seen it on your uh, yeah, jump on your Instagram page pretty regularly. I've seen a lot of that uh, cool leather work. It seems like it just goes hand in hand, the creativity with the hot rods. And for me, anytime you get the opportunity to use, you know, skills or incorporate stuff like that in a vehicle build, like woodworking, leather work, it's it makes it really neat. You know, the Mr. Gasket truck, we got to do some of that on and it was. Yeah. I love fun. that build. That was cool. Yeah. And you know, like you said, it, it, it's also enabling and that it's an excuse to constantly expand your knowledge. So, you know, a lot of the content, for example, that I use in our vehicles, isn't necessarily appropriate nor traditional down to our supply chain. So some of the, you know, wild caught alligator interiors or vegetable tanned or hand tooled interiors ranging through to like Chilowich, which is a more technical textile weave through to aerospace rail car marine for higher quality lighting and little gizmos and bits. And I, I, I used to be more sensitive to it, uh, but now I think it's turned out to be my secret blessing and that I have no proper education. I did. I have zero degrees. I have passion. I have vision, for better or worse. And if I don't know it, I'll seek out the geek who knows it, and I'll take the classes. And I've gone all over the world to study with old masters in different crafts, and it's so much fun. It's so exciting, and it, it, it is excuse to constantly not have blinders on. You know, that's what the big tier one OEM car companies are for with their focus groups and shareholders and all the constrictions. But you look in our world, the independence that we have, it's a blessing. It's our secret power. And it certainly has its limitations. And there's things that are a pain in the ass or dreams you have that you can't amortize because you don't have the scale. But at the end of the day, right, the purity and the rides that you guys, us and your other customers put out, it's only possible. It's only possible in, in that sort of space. It is. It, it always seems like the limitation is usually just budget because the creativity can often be limitless. Limitless. Yeah. yeah. And <laughs> resources, right? Skill set resources. Right. Finding the talent. Talent such a constriction in our industry right now. It's very sad. Well, I want to bounce to your nifty background. What's up with that? Did you guys fab that or is that from an old service stall at a dealership like would go in front of a bay? Because I have one designed by Raymond Lowy for a local Cadillac dealership and I'm a big Lowy geek and I got the history that Lowy was hired by Cadillac because they decided that the, the dealership should be an experience and it should have a consistent aesthetic, not from just the vehicles and signage, but through to the showroom, through to the service. And the idiots that own one of the really cool old, it's called Cassidy Cadillac, this kick-ass historic building old caddy dealership. When they ditched their remote service facility, which at that point was a Hummer service shop anyway, they turned it into a Subaru dealer. They called the wrecking crew to come in and shell this killer brick building. And the mandate was everything dumpsters now. One of my employees' brothers, actually ex-employee already at that time, his brothers was on the construction crew. I get a call and he's like, dude, truck, trailer, you here now. Immediately. <laughs> Immediately. So I restored it and put it in. It's in my uh, 
office and right in the dumpster next to it was a nos cadillac neon clock oh, oh my god idiot just tossed in the dumpster it's like just ugh, humans hey, yeah that stuff the stuff is so neat phil actually found an original one and i think that was kind of what got this uh, yeah. rolling and what inspired us for that and he found it on craigslist phil who's the manufacturer on it uh, the one we got's an ale mite um i've been chasing them for years and like they'll come up and they're either like in california or out in new york and they're 15 20 30 thousand dollars and i found one that was fairly close i think it was in ohio and five gram it had a killer patina on it it was an old ale mite one um it said had an awesome piece of like a old chicken wire kind of wrinkled glass on the top that said tune-ups um, <laughs> and i think i bought it for it was like five grand or 6500 bucks something yeah. like that um the guy broke the uh the piece of glass as he was taking it out of his truck to unload no. it here yeah. um that was the thing the thing made it like 60 yeah. years i was here receiving it fills out of the shop and the guy has an absolute meltdown and i'm looking at it and i'm like dude my brother's gonna be pissed like this, this is the that was the coolest part it survived all those years and it couldn't make it from ohio to here wrapped up in the back of the guy's truck when i first found mine our shop was my first location in van nuys which we quickly outgrew so we had to like haul it around this multi-tenant industrial complex and we take over another unit then we'd have to go around another person or across the lot and get another 1200 square feet so for years my form and every time we had to move it it's like, can I just throw this away? Like, he told him, I'm like, nope, do not. And we finally moved into our new shop about 10 years ago. I finally have a proper office. My old office was no windows in the back of the corner behind all our pallet racking, loud as hell. And it was literally like six by eight feet. So now I have a somewhat proper office full of all my ephemera and vintage nonsense. You got to have it. Yeah, the, this so I, ended up, I had to roll a couple panels and repowder coat and re-anodize and uh, change the veneer top. But it even had like the old air chucks and the the old yeah, uh, pegboard cool. for tools on the back. Super cool. Yeah, love that stuff. That was the inspiration for this. So then we uh, kind of came up with a concept and ran this whole thing. This all went through our engineering department, and this <laughs> it's ended up as like a binder. You know, about an inch thick of engineering drawings. It's all laser cut. We fabbed it in house. So if was, anybody. Uh, Magic Mike involved? Uh, this one actually was not Magic Mike's work. This went through uh, Noah, yeah. who uh, this was kind of his first little custom project. Would have uh, been a 90 page binder if Mike had got his hand Probably, on yeah. It would have been motorized <laughs> and, you know, sliding and moving. Autoclave. And, oh, yeah, and, you know, carbon fiber, yeah. but it still came out pretty sweet. If you know anybody that has a wall size of space, about that size there's, we could repl yeah, replicate it's probably it about fifty thousand dollars in engineering <laughs> we'd love to share that with somebody we're happy to just give you the stuff so if anybody wants to build one we'll, we'll laser cut it and send you a to-do kit you know do it yourself or kit i might end up taking you up on that because well, perfect uh, man. recently uh, designed my dream home kind of in my derelict style so i bought an 1852 salvaged barn from uh like ontario new york state borders and we scanned it, denailed it, kept all the original wooden joinery, took it apart, fumigated, put it in storage, and then I CAD modeled it and then built a derelict home from either reclaimed or local on my land found stonework and everything. Problem is, as you guys have been there, I'm not used to... I'm not used to being on that side of the table of my ridiculous taste and design. <laughs> so like now I actually have to pay for my stupid ideas and I'm not ready for that world. I keep getting the GC quotes on it. I'm like, oh shit, I guess I'm putting that on pause for God knows how long. Uh, sounds like a hell of, of a cool course, idea though. Yeah. Part of it's an absurd uh, workshop for many of my hobby proclivities and uh, that would be uh, very at home in there. Well, finding somebody in that construction world that, one is willing to put up with a customer like you would be or you know like we would be that's like no sweat the details sweat the details sometimes it's like well man you get this arch and you've got this right it'd be so much easier just 90 degree angle here we'll do this and they always want to kind of doing that things. with me on doorways like i found these kick-ass vintage spanish doors with a beautiful arc top and he's yeah. like Oh, you know, when we frame it, I'm like, I don't give a shit. It's 10 times cooler. And like, yeah. that's where I will blow unnecessary money. You can keep your smart home nonsense to hell with that. I'm happy with Bluetooth speakers and part right. beyond. But 
yeah, it's all about the details. I did find the right partners. The problem is I just have to, I, you know, uh, what is it they say? Build for the classes, live with the masses, build for the masses, live with the, yeah, I got that one backwards. So <laughs> yeah, uh, I know what you mean. I'm margin <laughs> industry, unfortunately. Yep, that's for sure. Well, well, hopping back to the beginning, like we kind of start try to start all of our podcasts with, um, you tell us a little bit about the childhood. It's obviously pretty unique. I mean, child child actor. I mean, from Charles in Charge and Beans Baxter. I mean, tell us where that that's a it's a pretty crazy beginning. Well, unlike most of our guests, that's for sure. Yeah, it's uh, a series of what I call lily pads. Right, if you keep an open mind. You never know how you're going to get across the pond and one opportunity, one handshake, one chance meeting turns into another. So I was born in a country town in Maryland called Elk Ridge. And my parents were from the eastern shore along the Chesapeake in Virginia. My, my dad um, was a Coast Guard captain and the first in his family to make it off to college. And he became a corporate maritime uh, litigator attorney, and they were big into car show. I'm mean, into dog shows. My dad was a car dude, though. He had 104 uh, Austin Healey and some other neat stuff when I was a kid, one at a time. But we grew up fairly, I wouldn't say poor, but no luxury whatsoever. But my parents were so intent on me and my older sister getting opportunities to experience, you know, travel and culture and education beyond what had been afforded to them that one of their friends who bought one of our their dogs um, was a senator's wife and she lived in DC and she's a magnificent woman and um, she became my godmother and part of the negotiations my parents did with her was we were to go and spend like at least a weekend every couple months with her in DC which then meant, you know, going to the Smithsonian or going to the Kennedy Center, going to see shows or whatever, just culture, just exposure. Um, Senator Monroney, you know, like on cars, they call it the Monroney, they, all the disclosure on the window. That was her husband who came up with that rule, which I actually just figured out in the last couple of years. But on one of those trips uh, to go stay with her, I was seven and she took us to the Kennedy Center and it turned out to be, it was to see Mikhail Brinchnikov in his first U.S. Uh, appearance ever. And it was uh, Don Quixote. So she's super hooked up. So we got to go backstage afterwards to meet him. I sucked at sports. I got kicked out of Boy Scouts. I, I asked too many questions of Boy Scouts. This is stupid. I thought we were going to get to build cool stuff. And we're like, it was like Jimmy Carter era. We're like making cardboard and peanut shell airplanes. I'm like, this sucks. I thought we were going to like get to go camping and do stuff and like you kid out of here uh, in sports. I just always sucked at them. So when Brent Shikoff asked me, do you dance? It's like not even part of the culture where I lived, but I knew better than to say dancing for girls. So I quickly said, well, uh, no, sir, I don't. He said, why not? I said, I'm, I'm too short. Well, what I didn't know is that's the worst last possible thing you should say to him because Apparently, everyone always told him he'd never amount to anything as a dancer because of his height. Wow. Hmm. So I inspired him to take me under his wing. He sponsored me, and uh, I went to the um, Baltimore Repertory Dance Theater, and only for like a summer was training and taking classes there, which was cool because we didn't have money for summer camp. I was bored out of my mind anyway. And then one of those kids was going to New York City for a audition and my mom like slipped him 20 bucks and said can Jonathan just we were I was close friends with the other kid anyway we said can he go with you just to see the big city uh, I did turned out it was a cattle call meaning any idiot who walked in could sign their name could audition I was bored so I signed my name up I looked left looked right copied what they did and tried to mimic it and ended up getting it and then that turned in, that was Peter Pan, which ran on Broadway for a year and a half. And then at that point, I was just trying to hold on to the wave because it just, it literally constantly kept going and going. I, I did other Broadway shows, off Broadway, Shakespeare in the Park, which then, you know, suddenly I have agents and a manager and I'm doing TV and then CBS put me under contract, moved me to California. Now, when I got out here, I realized you can get a license at 15 and a half. I'm like, okay, this is cool. I'm not leaving this joint. <laughs> and the stunt coordinator on a show is a massive car geek. It's pretty much all good stunt coordinators are. 
and he introduced me into SoCal car culture. I met Tony Nancy um, back then, uh, you know, the way uh, sitcoms used to work back then, maybe today, I don't know, it's long gone in my reality, but you'd work for two weeks and you'd have a week off. Well, on that week off, I started going to Tony Nancy's shop, which was near my house. I'd literally bicycle over there, beg my mom who hates to drive for a ride, and just shut up and learn, sweep the floors and just really started getting deeper and deeper into car culture, mostly through hot rod buddies, through Tony's community. And I had a great career. It was super fun. I got to travel the world. I was given respect by adults in a way that would have not been possible in my otherwise middle of nowhere country reality as a kid. Um, and it was lovely. And then as I got older, I got a stalker that was not so lovely, um, which got pretty dark for a while. And uh, cars had already been deep passion. I've been building them before I could drive. So I talked my wife into quitting her real job. And uh, we were on vacation in Africa over a bottle of wine, decided, screw it, get home. This hobby of dialing in and flipping land cruisers, which is a whole nother story. I'd start as a bet in a USC business class, extension class. Um, got into a big debate with the professor and another student. And I was saying, you know, there's this new thing called the intranet or something like that that's coming around and seems to me with remember the truck trader and the recycler and oh, everything yeah. like with all this new media it seems like if you could control the supply you could create the demand so I, my argument to them was supply and demand could feasibly be turned on its heels so they said i was a tart and it's never going to happen ended up being a thousand dollar bet to drive a trackable market up 30 points and I, I think in a quarter or six months. So I was buying, I loved land cruises from my travel experiences and places where it's like life or death. They were the difference between life and death. But coming back to the States, they were like that Toyota Jeep thingamajigger and like no one really got it and give them proper restos. So I just started buying up the best ones I could find, which really wasn't that hard. And started, I just, at first, smarter than I am today, didn't modify, didn't restore, just dial them in, fix what's wrong, present it and resell it. Best and I went to back it. to collect on that bet. And they're like, we were joking. What are you talking about? So then <laughs> went on the vacation with my wife to Africa, then made the decision there might be something there. Came home, quit our jobs. And that's when we started TLC. Huh. That's wild. That is... Yeah, really interesting experiences. Well, like you said, it's interesting you're talking about uh, you were looking at it from that standpoint with with that market of control control the supply and then you control the demand and it's we're very much we're all doing that in our businesses now very much so you know it's I'd say I it, it if if properly funded that's viable like I don't know if you remember the story of the first gen GT 40s there was a investment group from I, I can't quantify this story but i've heard it from several people over the years there was an investment group that was investing in commodities but the more regulated they got the less power they had and the less money they were making so they had the idea of let's grab every one of those four gt40 weirdo things that people kind of dig but most people didn't really know about and they bought the majority of them globally and then started trickling them back. And I hear there's another group that's recently doing that with Lusso versions of uh, vintage Ferraris. <laughs> so for me, it bit me in the ass years later with TLC because suddenly I couldn't source the damn vehicles and they were triple what I used to pay for them. And then with Icon, way worse, way worse. Like the second we started doing Thrift Masters, I, you know, we're self-funded, we're mom and pop financially. So, I mean, we don't owe anyone any money, which is cool, but I only had enough liquid cash to chipmunk away maybe a dozen old Thriftmaster five windows. And then once we opened our mouth and came to market, like immediately, you know, now there's several shops doing them and culturally they're way more popular. Like I, have you guys seen a massive uptick in chassis for them versus where, you know, five, 10 years ago? Yeah, we have. That's always been like a pretty strong performer for us. I think that's like the quintessential old truck. Yeah, it's, yeah, it's, 
Americana. It, yeah, it just there. looks, you know, the F100s and things, they never really looked right. That Those 48 to 54 Chevys just... they have fenders. Everybody's like, I want the old truck that yeah. looks... Yeah, Yeah, you feel it. They're, they're neat to sit in. They're just, they're cool to drive. They're, yeah, they've always been yeah, popular. The ergonomics are feasible. The layout's, you know, reasonable size. Yep. I they're made of such thick metal, they didn't rust away either. Yeah, yeah, they're actually pretty... We've done several of the original paint patina builds with our derelict series and it's pretty impressive body quality kind of actually sad compared to Detroit sixties, seventies, uh, <laughs> metallurgic condition. Oh yeah. And the, the, those trucks are amazing. We just, uh, sold a really, we had a 52 that we, uh, sold a friend of ours, uh, what Casey Wagner from Wagner motorsports. He's building yeah. a survivor, uh, out of the truck, but it's unbelievable when you have one that is just a super clean survivor, how well, the hood functions you can't if you i don't know how you do it but trying to make restoring one of those trucks or hot rotting it and making that damn hood open and close Without with nice body work back. oh my god yeah. is it that is the, that is a I, challenge those damn coils those stupid snail springs because they fight the alignment no matter what you do on the front ends all over the darn place we ended up making a bunch of pretty complex fixtures so we had the front end to a known squared position and then, God forbid, you have to use any of the aftermarket sheet metal, which is a whole different shit show. But we recently actually just said to hell with those hinges and designed our own gas struts, which really helped the alignment and the centering. Are you doing yeah, any of those re repop bodies? Or are you using you using original on everything? I'm trying to use original wherever possible. You know, I I tried a complete build with one of the new bodies, and I, I won't mention any names, but unfortunately, it's my opinion that. Uh, many of especially sheet metal suppliers, they're all coming from the same place, mostly through the same distributor. And there's like a family feud going on there where they refuse to really directly communicate. So none of the feedback from pro builders or consumer home builders is even making it back to manufacturing. If you're doing a fender, okay, you may need to nip it. If you're doing a door, you may need to pull the skin and hem it or whatever. But you try and use 100% of their products, it's like rearranging deck chairs on the Titanic because nothing fits anything. Oh, yeah. Like when the Mustang bodies first came out, what a disaster. Yeah, those were. It, it's tough to work. I mean, any any aftermarket sheet metal, it's just, it's always a challenge. You go and put a fender on a square body truck and you'd swear right. that it's, you know, it's an F100 fender that you're trying to put on a Chevy <laughs> truck. It's, I mean, but you know just, what? In, in, in defense of the, aftermarket community well before i defend them let me bitch about them a little bit more <laughs> with the reverse engineering technologies that are out there at such a really reasonable price point or just lease it and have a dude come in with the best scanner or whatever right there's no excuse for a lack of precision so that's enough beating on them now i'm going to support them if you look at the tolerances like if like for example first gen bronco if you i've seen it in writing in the ford archive the original Foreman assembly line manual. You guys know what the allowed body tolerance is on a first gen Bronco? We can go half an inch. <laughs> yes, sir. Half an inch. Wow. Yes. So, you know, and, and that's also really constricted some of my craziest ideas where I want to take responsibility for an entire platform because if, you, if the, the aftermarket is dealing with those variances, and to make their business model make sense and to amortize all their tooling, they have to be able to sell you a cab corner patch panel, floor section one, two, three, four. Well, if you're really going to evolve the fit and finish and rigidity and quality, you need to be talking about super formed aluminum or roto milled steel or aluminum or autoclaved unitized honeycomb reinforced carbon. If you do that, you either need a very rich granddad who doesn't give a damn and is enabling you, or you need enough production to take 100% engineering responsibility. And instead of the floor being 12 panels that are spot welded sloppily together, it should be one piece or two pieces. But it's, it's even with the efficiencies we see, right, as the tech evolves, it's still a long way from being able to make a reasonable business case to take that level of responsibility but I, i'd love the opportunity i've got a couple projects i'd love to scratch build based on some really cool vintage designs that would be fantastic i mean it's great that it exists because where would we be without having 
a panel to get started with. But I, I always I always wonder what happens in like a body shop. Like a guy, I'm sure the majority of these classic cars end up restored by like a body shop. You know, you bring it in. I've seen it time and time again. Guy gets a Mustang. I want a restoration. Now, how does I grew up in the body shop business. If you get your fender for that, you know, Honda Civic, if it shows up and it even has the slightest dent, I mean, you run into the production manager and get an additional time to fix that little dent. There's no possible way it's not bolting right onto the car. And get, how do you even, how do they even handle that? I mean, we just, we split them, we cut them, we cut the inner structure out of them, we shift wheel openings. I mean, it's, yeah, it's mind blowing, but at least it's there. Something to get started yeah. with. So it's 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 a paved road. It's viable, but at the same time, you know, like body shops, especially here in California, disaster. You really end up in you have two classes of body shops. You got the professionally run shop that knows what's up, and they run a proper business. And let's say they take on that resto and have to miter and pinch and shrink, and they're not going to do it again. They're going to like screw that. I want to wreck Prius, and I'm going to knock that out. I'm going to take the insurance. Oh, yeah party on or you have the artisanal passion driven guy who unfortunately i hate to support this stereotype generally sucks at running a business he brings in enough deposits to load the race trailer and go party on in the soft flats or whatever i can't get consistent timelines or quality out of him so you don't have the business etiquette we're at the point now we we're already partnered in one and we're looking to buy another body shop because it's it's become a huge bottleneck to find that balance of craftsmen and and proper business structure. It's, it's a real I, challenge. I can imagine that's got to be quite a challenge for you. You know, I've always been incredibly impressed with the the volume that you do and the quality that you maintain at that volume. And it raises a lot of questions with me because I look at it and I'm like, how the hell does this dude do this? Like, because the body shop, you know, the, the body and paint process, it's so labor intensive. And to, to wow. repeat it and in volume at a high level, man, I don't, I mean, my hat's off to you for making it happen. Fixtures, a lot of fixtures, a lot of jigs, a lot of uh, kisses and kind words. And like literally we sent it to the body shop. It's in a, a, a zinc suspension epoxy powder coat on a rotisserie silver platter stripped down with like a big ass deposit check. And then, <laughs> but the, you know, we love, we're still losing them because of COVID and the eroding American Shall we say, I don't know, I think culture is too big of a statement, but the work ethic, right? Yeah, workforce. So we've lost uh, two of our principal body shops over COVID. They just <laughs> shut down for one reason or another or lost so much labor, hired new guys who don't know what the hell they're doing, that they're paying double what they paid the old dude who said, heck with this, I'm moving back to Florida and going to live in my mom's place and do my hobby as a business and show up on Etsy. But like... <laughs> The American dream, and I understand, I, I feel it too as an employer, you know, I think the, the, the whole dream and the pride of being capitalistic and, you know, building things you're proud of that are going to last and employing families and that, that whole rah-rah is getting chipped away at by modern cultural factors. And to me, it's saddening. And it's a big part of why anyone cares to hear, although we may speak our mind more often than the world wants to hear, but it's part of what made America great were innovations and risk taking and new ideas and trying and creating and manufacturing. And, you know, we've had several presidencies that like some flat out said, yeah, go to Target and buy something. We'll be fine. Uh, I don't know about that. Like it's a bigger picture. We, we have to reinvigorate the labor force and we have to, I always say this one, decriminalize blue collar. Oh, yeah. It should not be yeah. a pity on you. You're a moron. Go to shop class. Or there aren't even shop classes. California Unified School District canceled them all. Yep. They're dead. I used to be on the board, advisory board. Man, I got GM involved. I got Snap on involved. I got Michelin to bring money. Like I brought in like muscle to fund it and support it. I literally got a call from the chair and they're like, you know, um, you don't need to come in anymore. You're too disruptive. <laughs> and it's killed the whole program. So, and let's face it, right? Not even guy, even kids that are drinking the Kool-Aid and like get into massive debt and go to law school, they graduate. Well, I got news for you, kid. Like Watson is better at 90%, they're saying, of general law. AI is better than 90%. So unless you're 
super, super niche. I mean, even in my dad's career, he'd have like top 10%, top Harvard, whatever, law school grads running as copier. So that that's broken. So we need to return. We, you know, I've, like you guys, I have plenty of contractor clients, plumber clients, people that stereotypically the, the cultural judgment would be, oh, that's blue collar. You know, he, oh no, he's doing better than I am. You know, I'm always doing oh, yeah. just fine. And he's, and he gets, dare I say, those clients have a deeper understanding for the craft and the passion and the detail ridiculousness that goes into elevated quality of projects like our collective projects. So like that's hundred percent, but we, there's several generations, ours and our generation included that bears the responsibility for that. Forget, yes. forget society part, even raising children. We've, we've all got kids here. I know Jonathan, you, it's, it says here, you've got a couple of kids. Um, yeah. my, my just sent my daughter to college last week, just moved her in. Um, and, you know, for the last year talking about what she wanted to do. My son will be 16 in a month or so, and he's talking about what he wants to do. And instantly my mind is going to what they can do to be successful, you know, and we're looking at, well, this job, this, this, it, and I have to take a second to realize, well, I'm doing exactly what I bitch about everybody else for the last two generations has been doing, yeah, you know, we have, to change, we have to change the narration and the stories we tell and the examples we share. Uh, what's your 15 year old's name, boy? Boy, Blaze. Yeah. So uh, cool name. So with Blaze, here's here's another one that freaks me out. Wow, when do you get your license in your state? Sixteen. Sixteen. Is he down with it? Is he already dreaming up what his car oh, yeah. is? Yeah. Like, uh, could I have Uber? Yeah. No, he, he's, yeah. he's he's he wants to drive. The, yeah. That is okay, the craziest cool. thing ever because most kids don't, aren't even getting their license. No, they're not ready. They don't care. I heard about this. I'm like, are you are, are you it's serious? Not, like, I well, couldn't. I mean, I went. Have, yeah. The day I turn 16, you take off a of school so you can go that morning to get your license because you are. Shit, amazing. I let my son play hooky on 15 and a half to go get his permit. I'm like, hell yeah, son, go for it. <laughs> yeah. My kids, I mean, your kids have oil in their blood too, just even just from all the fumes that we've inhaled. <laughs> yeah. It's probably not the healthy term, like, yeah. kind of. <laughs> but uh, yeah, both my kids are gearhead, and one just graduated last year. Uh, doing uh, design at Otis, and my other son's at uh, University of the Pacific for mechanical engineering. Oh, that's cool. But you know, they're 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 the oddballs. Like literally, I remember when my son got his license. Whatever, thirty kids, let's say, in his class, there were three that had their license. Everyone else, like, there's an app for that. It was like, oh my god, oh, that's crazy. Like, I couldn't wait to hop in my car and get my freedom. It was on yeah. when I was a kid. Oh yeah, that was the ultimate freedom. Like I, I probably put like twenty thousand miles on the first month, just cruising, <laughs> doing like absolutely nothing, just driving and like feeling that freedom. But well, that's yeah, I'm blown away when kids don't get their license. It's, it's all about how you raise them. I mean, my son, he's eleven, and he has his car planned out down to the chassis, the tires, the motor, what valve covers are going on it. Oh, excellent. I mean, he is just it's detailed, like. Harry did, and he can't wait. We're, you know, we're gonna have to get started here probably in the next year or so because <laughs> it takes a while. It's gonna take a while to put that together. But well, Do you guys yeah, ever have your boys work in the shop in the summer? Yeah, my son. Well, so Blaze, Josh's son, has been working here now for uh, pretty much all summer, yeah. helping out in the CNC department and oh, cool. uh, getting his hands dirty. You know, my son, he comes in, we play around. He can, you know, run a TIG welder, run a MIG welder. You know, we play with the bead rollers and sheet metal shaping stuff. But, uh, yeah, so, I mean, as the operation gets larger and larger, it's hard to just pop in and uh, spend the time you want with them out on the shop floor. You know, my yeah, hands don't get as, as dirty as I'd like them to these days. So it's, I become a little office girl now, I swear. Yeah, my, my, the hand, the, my hands are getting soft, and it's, yeah, it's embarrassing. Well, my hands you know? are still ruined <laughs> from leather craft, but, like, I don't know if I could stack dimes and do a sexy tip beat anymore. I'm a little rusty. Oh, back but my, my oldest son, Nash, um, we tease him all the time, me and my younger son, Quinn. We call him a ricer. He's got, like, a BRZ, and he's, you know, it's got HREs and all that crap on it. Rides like shit because he lowered it so far. <laughs> But there's hope. So my younger son, who's 20, Quinn, he's got a 71 BMW TII. And he's rebuilt his long block. He did a five-speed conversion. He stole out of my collection AC and did his AC, did Recaro's. Like, 
and he's into leather craft too, so he stitch up his own tool bag. So he's all he's That's all awesome. Like, That's awesome. Back on the paint and body thing, it I got a question on and with your customer, especially when you're doing it um, at 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 the volume you are, um, and I mean you've got guys from all guys and girls from all walks of life. Do you not that it matters? You wouldn't change what you're doing anyway, but do you find that? your expectations for the quality, especially in the paint and body, far exceed what they can see or what they're looking for? And how do you kind of, because I know we've seen that on stuff before, you know, where our eyes and your eye is, has been trained and is probably looks at things with a little bit more scrutiny than your normal guy does if it's just shiny um, uh, versus, yeah. the, you know. Because you're, you want everything to be a 1,500-hour custom paint job where everything's yeah take it to five thousand yeah. i mean it's got to be lines you know, are razor sharp it's flat yeah this is well, we want to impress that like last quarter of a one percent <laughs> with how well it, it comes out i've had to check myself because i i think honestly all four of us we're never a hundred percent happy with anything we build i can say that i can admit that i don't know if you know 100 percent yeah always <laughs> My client may never see it. I may be stupid enough to even point it out to the client. He's like, you're out of your mind. You're an idiot. I, like, I could give a shit. I'm happy. Yeah, there's always something. And uh, body and paint's a big challenge. So I, one thing I started, and I don't know, I mean, I mean, you guys will probably know if any other Goobers are doing this. And I started trying and testing about 20 years ago. We had a partnership with a powder coat manufacturer. And I've always, because I used to paint my own stuff and everything anyway, um, but you can only get a gun into so many crevasses, right? So I always used to wonder, like, and you, you've seen it, either you've built it or you've taken apart something, another, even a top shop's built, and you tear the door down and get good light in there, and it's like raw steel, and you're like, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. So I've been powder coating my bodies. So after all heat-related weld repairs are done and everything's pretty happy, if the sh stamping shape of the body will allow for it, and it's a little bit of guesswork, or the gauge and vintage allow for it. Man, I powder coat prime. Hmm. Body shops hate it because then blocking and fillings and pain in the ass because it's so, the, the bite is so strong. Sure. But now you got chemical tooth and mechanical tooth yep. and you have coverage well beyond anything. I don't care who you are, how talented you are, you're ever gonna get with a paint cut. Those bodies so handling, really they're helped. handling that heat. They're handling the heat sometimes. I mean, yep. you're doing yeah. 300, right? I powder you i mean 450 yeah no, you're four, some of it. 450 up so there's now some new um technical evolutions in lower heat powders and i've focused just instinctually again because i don't know any better because i'm not trained i was like well shit. what about like dry docks what about pipelines that go under sea like what what coatings on those so that's where i started as far as class of coating sure. and then that's helped a lot and then my big cheat because of my Deep, deep love for body shops. Uh, you know, my Icon FJs, we have those bodies made brand new. They're 5052H32, and they're thick. They're literally built by a shipwreck. So we block them to get the heat lines out from the welds. I powder coat the whole body and then polyurea coat the underside. I never have to go to a body shop, and it makes me so <laughs> Dude, That's the way to do it. We, we had that uh, the Rampage Camaro. That was one car we had because there was so much tube work in it, and it was more of a race car, and we, we powdered the whole thing white to start. But that was yeah. my concern. I mean, you, we, we didn't we, we just kind of let them overspray the exterior panels, but, I mean, you'd see the, just the color on the metal from the yeah. heat. But you, even if you just whisked the jams and the gaps and where the pinch seams are and stuff, it makes it, it I, I'm a big believer. Oh, it is great. I mean, it, you feel so confident with the fact that it's, it's everything is sealed. Coded. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of my vehicles, you know, we do plenty of cars and two wheel drives, but the vast majority of four by, and a lot of them are going into really crappy environments. So it, it really makes me feel a lot better. Um, it definitely helps out a lot, but added cost, added time. Nowadays though, honestly, the cost isn't even additional. It's more time. But the cost of California air quality, coast management, whatever the hell they're called, but like the California greeny friendly uh, paints and primers and sealers, the costs have just become astronomical. Oh, you probably need to be able to eat all the materials, like literally be able to ingest them. 
in order yeah. to spray them in California at this point. Me, that's I would imagine. Darwinian. Like, if you're dumb enough to eat it, you die. Well, then the world might. Uh, <laughs> uh, but yeah, the um, and the costs are astronomical. My cost delivering to them on a silver platter for a complete with like quality steelwork and everything already done, I'm blowing 30 grand and up for a paint job. So I've had to like check my clients and myself. And, t- you know, I don't think a lot of people realize like, okay, if you want, if you know the difference and you want to entertain my geekness, I'll go there. Let's party. But, you know, a Riddler lever, a Riddler, Riddler level paint shop, Pebble Beach paint shop. There's six digit paint shop. I don't yeah. care. I don't care if it's done in Georgia, Illinois, where the yeah. hell you're doing it. They're six digit paint shop. Honestly, I find 99.9% of the time, once you get into that, it controls expectations. Yeah. You're like, no, we're good. <laughs> we're good. Party on. Well, especially when you see the quality of what brand new vehicles, expensive brand yeah. new vehicles look oh, like suck. right now. Yeah. I, I can't believe how bad they're getting. I mean, on. It's not even orange peel. It's grapefruit peel. I mean, like, yeah. it's, 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 it's brutal. Yeah. yeah, the colors uh, that you always you look to, like Ferrari, Lamborghini, Aston Martin, some of their colors. And they look so much different when you put them down and you cut them flat. Yeah, yeah, yeah because you're you're yeah. taking the inspiration from the brand new car, but it's yeah, it's literally like I mean, it's the most textury, like dull thing you've ever seen. Yeah. I had a neighbor who got some new fancy pants Audi wagon. It's pretty badass, but it was black, and he's like an old school car guy, and he's looking at all the orange. Because like, this is not acceptable, and I warned him. But he took it to a guy. He's like, oh, you know, problem, man. We'll wet sand it down to like, you know, 3,000 grit. <laughs> and screwed the whole thing. Done. Uh-huh. Now, now it's got a wrap on it. Oh, no, that's <laughs> interesting. I mean, Phil, yeah, Phil's got the wagon, the RS6 Audi wagon. Like, he, you know, when you, funny you talk about wrap because he wrapped his Miata. But on the <laughs> wagon, he took his wagon. You did like the paint correction deal and the you know, uh, luminescent detailing did it. And it's. I mean, it looks so much better, but the car even it's a nice comes in. It looks like crap. You can't you can't rub yeah. on those new ones for long. I mean, it's I mean one shot. Yeah, there's not much material there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, let's face it. By design, forget about the paint job. You can't do much of anything for long on you high production cars, even low volume yeah. high. It's not a good business model. You know, Toyota actually studied uh, from Microsoft back in the day when laptops first came in the market, right? And they're like. Wait a minute. So help us understand this. Y'all are saying when that battery dies, you still have 90% brand loyalty, but they're not replacing the battery. They're buying a new laptop. Please teach us how you're going to get away with that. <laughs> like the old Land Cruisers, part of the brilliance of them, they were built by an independent entity back in the day called Arakawa. Well, today Toyota bought Arakawa and it's called Arako. And they still do, bless them, hold to that higher standard. But Arakawa back in the day, man, they did 18-wheelers, military vehicles, forklifts, and land cruisers. Hmm. And they had a completely different ethic above and beyond the quality level of Toyota product at that time. Simple, long-lasting, like industrial design priorities that are abandoned by everyone now because it makes better business to make something that you know, even if you take good care of it, when your touch screen doesn't work in seven years and you even find one that the dealer has, damn screen that integrates everything costs more than the residual value of the car. So unfortunately, that leads to shit on a global waste. By the way, yeah. you got the first. Oh, yeah, I've heard people. I haven't oh, found yeah. one. I'll yeah. try. It. But anyway, this disposable society, you know, on so many levels. I, I do feel that we're starting to see a shift, right? Where people are starting to go, mm, maybe I'm not going to go to the big box store and buy a $20 backpack for my son because the last two I bought for him in school lasted 30 days. Now they're going on Etsy or on Instagram and finding, you know, niche makers, mom and pops, heart and soul, people that are like all in to make a quality product. And yeah, they might be, Spending 150, 200 bucks on that piece, but it lasts 10 times as long, if not more. So that's like, you know, my wife with the damn Yeti coolers, I'm going to have to go and start, I'm going to be buying those cheap things because it's going to be the only thing I can afford after we're done spending every penny that we have on Yeti coolers. But you buy yeah. these, I mean, they last well, it's forever. forever you you know? mentioned, <laughs> it's funny you mentioned that about the, the, the niche brands is because now it's the culture, it has changed. It's not about 
having to have the biggest brand name, it's almost more, you know, they're, they're searching out whether they know for sure the quality is going to be there or not. It's more comfort to be like, I've, I've found this small thing that these guys probably care more about their product than anybody else. And plus, I feel like I found it before anybody else did. Oh, yeah. yeah, I hope you're right. I am seeing those trends across many segments. And uh, I, I, that, that fills me with warm and fuzzy feelings, right? Because the more people understand that, the more sustainable and massive we get because there's less crap going straight to landfill and cycles. And the more non-global corporate commoditized garbage vendors there are and, you know, power back to the people, so to speak, and seeing a community that'll support mom and pops and craftsmen, et cetera. Again, my same old brand. It's super cool to see that actually happening more and more. And it's not just here. I'm seeing that with friends in Japan and well, Japan's been smart on that forever. In fact, I've studied in Japan lost American arts that like the best American leathercraft tour can't fill a room in a hotel with people. But in Japan, it's got a two year waiting list because they're so good at taking a, a traditional craft and then just geeking out and taking it to a level well beyond it had ever been before. But same with, you know, throughout Europe, it's 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 happening in many cultures around the world. And, and I, I love it. Yeah, I, I, we I already have that crap. Yeah. Oh yeah, we've got. Plenty. I mean, that could be our saving grace. That would, you know, it's going to energize the next generations to do something with their hands. I feel like that is something that, you know, that technology, social media has really brought to the table is like an outlet to promote that stuff. I mean, you see so many cool handmade leather goods and handmade clothes and handmade boots, and there is definitely more of a I guess a desire. I mean, I find myself seeing that stuff and it's like, it's not something I'm necessarily into, but I just kind of want it. Cause you're like, Oh, that is something that yeah, well, somebody created it by hand. You could tell that there's a lot of passion in it. The quality is there. You just kind of, you, you for, want it. Forget all the, the right, you know, socially responsible reasons of why you should be doing these things and all that. I look at everything from a very simplistic nature and I look at the, the outlaw mentality in air quotes is a very broad statement, but the outlaw mentality is something that will never go away. And it doesn't matter. And the, everything just shifts is once something becomes mainstream, you know, the, the, the population has to run away from it as fast as they possibly can and find something that's so weird. And I mean, okay, now I'm going to be a cowboy today, you know, and I'm, cause nobody else is being a cowboy. I'm going to be a cowboy. I'm going to dress like a cowboy. I'm going to find the most you know, uh, traditional Western apparel that I can be. And then when everybody's being a cowboy, I'm not going to be a cowboy anymore. I'm going to go. And that's that mentality of just trying to find, do either make or purchase from people that have that same mentality to be, to be different. Yeah. It's individualistic, yeah. you know, it's a communication on anything, you know, your, your boots, your bag, your ride. It's a communication tool. It's, it's a way of communicating your individual self. And what I've been stoked about is I, and I know you guys have the same exact experience. I am blown away how many of my clients own two or three or four or five or six or, and more icon. I'm blown away. They were, that I'm in business and people can tolerate the price point of, of the reality of this level of craft anyway, but they're not consumers. I mean, we get the bond trader dude who gets his bonus, has to blow it by Monday, yada, yada, yada. And those guys never, it's not really fair to say, but I'll, there's a consumer who doesn't really get it. He gets it because the guy who gets it told him what was cool to put in his garage. Yep. And I hate that. But the vast majority, they're not consumers, man. They're ambassadors. And they believe in your story. I mean, when I came to market, I was super scared of my price point. My price point's gone higher because, number one, I was losing money on everything, and I realized, okay, this is cool and all, but it's got to be a viable business. And no luxury multiple segment stuff, just mom and pop viable operating margin business. But it's my customers who said, well, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? So that's how we end up running Brembo's on everything. That's how we graduate. I always hated carburetors, but we go from like a ramjet two LS9s, LS4s. I'm not a big LT fan, but that's a different discussion. But like, you know what I mean? It's it's the people that really get it and can fund it 
that have enabled it. And here I am decades later, and I'm able to call this a job. <laughs> yeah, that's awesome. Man. I, I remember always seeing your ads pop up in uh, DuPont registry. Yeah, you, good memory. Years and years ago. And the, I mean, the ads were kick ass, and the cars, you know, the trucks looked so good, but they had that look just like, you know, all these leather goods and these handcrafted things we're talking about. So simplistic, but like so unique and so handcrafted that you ju- you just kind of wanted it, you know, even though I'm not like a, you know, no offense, I'm not a land cruiser guy. I'm not really a Jeep guy, but you look at it and you're like, damn, like that's, that's fucking cool. I, I want one of those. I mean, granted, I certainly couldn't afford one, but you know, if I could, you know, if I, if I, if I could, man, I'd have one of those, you know, one of the little Jeeps that you do or something. Cause it's, it's that kind of look. So that's a, a uh, I'm so uh, to this day amazed with, how many people know of my brand? And more importantly, if they know the brand, they know what it stands for. That's priceless. So we, we were fortunate enough to stop advertising eight years ago. I don't miss that expense. <laughs> um, but yeah, when we created Icon, you know, it was right on the tail end of doing the FJ Cruiser prototypes for Toyota. And I got to go to m- many factories and going to, you know, peek behind the magic curtain and see how their businesses run. And I saw brilliant things. And I also saw things that I'm like, that seems highly dysfunctional. And I found myself asking myself the question, okay, if you, Jonathan, were to revisit the FJ40 in a modern context, what would it be? And I started, literally, it was like, instead of counting sheep jumping a fence in bed, and you goobers do the same thing, probably, you find yourself like zooming and 3D connection, mousing in pad models, in bed and like designing and tweaking and scaling and changing the champ or whatever like it, it got to the point that i had a whole model in my brain that i was 3d i suck in 2d i'm all i see everything in 3d i was visualizing and building i got to the point i have to make this i'm going to lose my remaining sanity if i cannot physically drive it, and feel it has to come out it has to once it, it gets to a certain point. yeah yeah and i realized i had to create a design aesthetic that was unique with it, which you kindly notice. Because what I was doing, you know, keep in mind when we we started doing this, I mean, there there really wasn't anyone, this space kind of didn't exist. No, it didn't. didn't or, you know, for the true evolved rest of mod sitch. I mean, you know, whatever you had pro street, you had pro touring, you had smoothies, you had hot rods to whatever and all that. And I grew up and then I dig that, but I always had kind of my own ideas of what I wanted to combine with the best of old and new. So that's why those icon had a very distinct look, which now we call new school, which I totally made up. But at the time I realized it had to have a defined aesthetic to get people to get out of preconceived notions just long enough to stop, hear our story and understand, no, no, this is different. This is evolved. This is all cat based. Like, this is cohesive. This is not a Johnny Cash parts bin special of shit from 18 different platforms and yards. You know what I mean? And over the years, I was stoked when we got that level of acceptance that then I introduced our old school package and the derelicts, which then took advantage of more retro styling or just the batch of derelict patina style, which again, when I started doing, everyone thought I was crazy. And they were like, well, what color are you going to paint it? Still saving up? And like, you know, get it, you know? And now it's collectively, right? Seeing so many home builders and shops, like a whole community grow out of that. It's it's really cool. Yeah, it's definitely, um, like you said, it's the whole community and making it, making it acceptable. And the, it took the customers as well as it took the builders to – to to have the balls and be confident in their own skin to do that because you you know you know as well as I do uh, especially repeat customers and customers that are in this scene there's a lot of them that are super worried about like showing up in a rusty crusty yeah, car making yeah. sure that everyone knows I mean because we're all the same way I'm not I'm not saying this is a derogatory thing we all want to show off everybody wants to show off they might want to show off in different ways but everybody wants to show off everyone wants to get noticed. So it, it took those few first guys that were like, I don't care. I think it's fucking cool. 
you know? And then every once you kind of see a few others are like, oh, so it is, so it, okay. I liked it, but I didn't know if like anybody else was going to like it. And, you know, the only, the only problem I have with that, and I like, I probably know this better than anybody because I drive a survivor 77 uh, square body, you know, every, every day. The biggest problem with it is everybody trying to buy it off you for like 15 to 20 grand. Every fucking gas station you go to. And I don't, I won't even enter. I'm like, ah, oh, man, it's not for sale. You know, sentimental factor. You got to understand. Yeah, but everybody makes you an offer. I'm like, dude, there's probably like $225,000 fucking dollars wrapped right. up in this damn thing. But I don't want to get into that. But I'm just, no, man, no, it's not for sale. You know, but it, it almost creates but, but, you know, more the conversation. Changes, the more and more changes we see in culture and the wealth divide and the gap and everything. You'd be surprised, like I've got prime minister, kings, princes, ridiculous net worth individuals. They're ordering derelicts. Yeah. They want to hide. Right. Oh. <laughs> One of them whose name I can't say recently informed me he was at a gas station and somebody came up to him and said, man, you look just like so-and-so. But it really? looked like he was driving some beat up piece of shit that was worth <laughs> five grand. So all the preconceived notions and social constructs were out the window. Instead, I said, yeah, you look like so-and-so, but man, I used to have a Bronco like that, blah, blah, blah. You know, and it, then it smiles and thumbs up and shared memories. Downside, again, being you have to hear about every damn rock they ever crawled over in 68. Yeah. <laughs> but like, it, it gets rid of that baggage. Yeah, it does. It does break. It uh, lowers the barrier of... Uh... Not of entry. Barrier of entry. Yeah. 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 No, exactly. it's, Maybe it's, it's relatable. It's something yeah, that it's the average guy can grab a hold of. And right. I might it's just, not about, was, about uh, yo, bling, bling, look at me and my bling ride. You know? Yeah. They've kind of never been our clients. Everyone always thinks because we're in California, it's all, you know, TV stars and movie stars. It's so not like whatever we have, a couple of those clients, but it's so not. Why are you so still not. in California? You know what? You're a smart <laughs> man. Solid question. <laughs> I do not. There is no intelligent answer to that question. <laughs> well, that, that's a no. good answer. I was going to tell you, the don't, weather, say, the, don't say the weather. <laughs> but yeah, I mean. Now, now, I mean, California is the most unreasonable um, business environment. Um, California, culturally, I honestly feel at this stage is broken, perhaps beyond repair. The disregard for the homeless, the collapsing infrastructure, the misappropriated tax dollars and misrepresented bills, you know, gets to the point you vote on something you think is supporting this. Well, you didn't know the back language. It actually supported the polar opposite. And I think that's, again, culturally very scary. If people lose that trust. And I'm over California. I'm here because I'm nothing without my incredible network of employees. Um, I've owned the, this house. I've lived here since I'm 52. I, I, I bought this house when I was 17. You know, I, and I, I love my space. I love my people. I love my community. And let's face it, you guys have done this. Moving a shop sucks. Oh, it is. Brutal. Everything's heavy. Everything. Oh, my God. Yeah, we but, did. yeah, at some, at some point, I mean, the, the house I just designed, uh, I bought 11 acres in Hill Country in Texas. And uh, that house would be built there, but at least into the knowable future, that would be a part-time residence, albeit with a batshit garage and CNC room and clean space <laughs> and workshop. So, you know, maybe the future would allow me to take my derelict and reformer one-off builds and turn it into like a omakase sushi where there's no clients, no communication. I build whatever the hell I want because they make hardly any business sense at all anyway and put it up when it's done and sell it and then keep operations here. But at some point we need to move. I recently sold the TLC brand. I don't know if you guys knew that. No, yeah. I didn't know that. Well, I mean, really past a point, I realized the customer culture, the standards for the employees, the process, everything. We were literally trying to run two religions in one church. Past the point, you're going to screw that up and you're not going to do 100% of either. So we hemmed and hawed about what to do in the backlog for TLC. And man, I found it was just getting absurd. So we we found a wonderful partner, a guy named Daniel, who is in the cruiser community and has been for many years. Um, we sold all the IP and uh, process and inventory and it moved to North Carolina. They're killing it. That's awesome. Makes me think that's where I need to move, right? Because 
the, the available skilled fabricator and technician workforce there now, especially because so many privateers bailed out of racing. Yeah. Yeah. You keep and hearing that more and more. Please come here. Here's incentives. Here's training funding uh, for new hires. Like they actually hear you. Yeah. Versus California's like, oh, you make stuff? Uh, yeah, get out. Yeah. I know. I mean, Tennessee's been kind of the draw for that. You got uh, Scots who moved from. Yeah, I don't know. Oxner, were they? Were that? And yeah, I think so. Down to yeah, and, uh, and Hotchkiss moved down there too, right? Didn't John move down there? Yeah, and then uh, man, Fuller moved to where? Where was he at? He's he's been in Atlanta for Has quite he, a while. He'd moved okay. to a new uh, spot, but he's been in Atlanta for a while. Yeah, a lot of guys. Tim Strange. Oh. Yeah. yeah, Bobby Alloway's got a nice little setup. Oh, yeah, kind hey, of, Bobby's got a harder than all beautiful. of us before we were thinking about it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, we stopped at Bobby's place at a one of the road tours. That's just gorgeous, man. Yeah, gorgeous. yeah, no hassle. Cool community. He's been so respected around so long. He's got his core employees, you know. But like Austin, Texas, buddies down there that have automotive brands, they're they're arguably having the same hiring challenges we're having in California. Yeah, I mean, Austin is now turning into a place that's very costly to live, so it's going to be probably more and more difficult to find yeah. you know, labor. Yeah, you got Rivian, you got Tesla, you've got a lot of computers, software, aerospace in that area, so God forbid you get into engineers. Like, I can't, I literally would have to look it up to recall exactly how many of my mechanical engineers have been stolen by JPL and aerospace firms. It's ridiculous. <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah, that's everything about that whole California and what you've got to do is. Oh, it's got to it's got to be brutal. And you're in some like you must be in some sizable square footage there. I would imagine yeah. with the, the amount of volume you're doing. Yeah, our building's about we got about eighty thousand square inside and forty outside. Damn. That's I don't awesome. want to talk about the cost of that I and mean, what it's it's just bad shit. And now with the legalization of weed, man, if you got an 80K or bigger warehouse in this county, the, the marijuana dudes are coming in and saying, okay, you want a dollar fifty a square foot, which is batshit enough for commercial space? They're like, yeah, no worries. We'll give you two twenty five. We'll prepay two years in advance. We'll give you an indemnity contract so you're not federally liable for a business. And like, Entire industries are having to leave the state from just the real estate factor on its own. And now, just in time. When are you moving? Yeah. <laughs> JIT and Kaizen, you know, now with the supply chain being what it is, that business model's broken. So, buddies in various industries through to my own. I mean, I had a 6X, I had a 6X multiply my shelf minimum levels just to ensure my production line stays rolling because of the variables in supply. So now the dude that had the 10,000 square foot warehouse, he needs a 20, the dude that had a 30 needs 50, and it's this chain reaction. It's oh yeah, crazy. yeah, we're experiencing, experiencing the same thing. We just expanded the chassis shop into an additional facility just because, I mean, we're busting at the seams and you real estate here is, I mean, commercial real estate is unbelievable. I mean, it's basically like California pricing at this point. So. Really? Are you guys fortunate enough to own your building? We own the building that the shop primarily is in, but we've leased the uh, building that we've just expanded to. Um, just because, just because we couldn't find anything that was worth owning or affordable enough to own. So no, I'm out. Like I'm screwed. <laughs> it's twelve to eighteen million for oh, yeah. a building that's going to be a redo and a maintenance cost suck. So like I, I can't I can't I can't it's, it. it's, it's just unbelievable. Yeah. They don't they don't want you to they don't want you to make things. Nope. So what's uh what's new? What are you so you you've you've off the uh you you talked about selling the TLC brand. Um Icon has been, you know, pushing stuff. You've got the the derelict series, you've got the uh uh the Thrift Masters, you've got the Broncos. Um I know you've like you said, the crazy mad scientist. What's uh what's new that's coming or what you've been working on? Well, my happy space is the one-offs, right? Which we do, we, we have two different classifications. We have what we call the derelicts and we have what we call the reformers. The driving mandate of that department is we got to love the client, we got to love the platform and everyone's got to be in love and stoked to build it. 
And we, it's got to be the right client who understands that all the non-reoccurring engineering costs and design costs, you know, our Broncos, Thriftmasters, and FJs, those priced anywhere from two to three and a half. That's only possible because we've amortized and we batch build with aircraft suppliers, our harnesses and every little widget and bracket. We're not bench breaking again and again. So that that made it a more viable, scalable-ish right model. But that price point's only possible with those relative efficiencies. So the one-offs, I mean, they just get stupid. But they're they're my happy zone as a as a fabricator, as a designer. So those, unfortunately, that department's booked up. Start dates were four years out. So I've gotten to the point when people call, I'm like, I can't, I, I can't respond to even take a deposit from you. There's too many variables. We're too many years out. So I just kind of keep a list of the people that really seem to get it and are super serious. But man, we got some cool projects in that line. Did you see that 49 Merc derelict EV we just finished? No, I didn't see I it. Saw, I saw the Merc. You did a Merc a while back. Are you doing another one? Because I remember seeing oh, one out at man. SEMA. Good old one-offs, five-year project. <laughs> yeah. So we were done, took it to SEMA, showed off. At SEMA, two key component partners for the EV tech were like, oh, you know, we just came out with this, which runs a dash this for better thermal management. And then the other dude's like, oh, we just came out with a new motor, does this. <laughs> so the client's a geek like me. He's like, oh, dude, that's cool. Like, I, whatever, I got rides. Like, let's let's take it apart and evolve it. And that's a whole nother story, right? As we get into these EVs, I don't want to be bless you. I don't want to be building iPhone sevens. I've always been proud that I'm upcycling shit that should last for decades more. Well, all the EV builds represent a brief moment in time, right? Yep, <laughs> that's, that's, that's really, what we're struggling really, with right now. Yeah, really concerns. Um, we got a Superbird. We ended up partnering with Speedcore on after a crappy LA carbon partner screwed the pooch and stole our money and delivered us junk. So we backed up and called the boys at Speedcore and they're killing it. Yeah, they're right in our neck of the woods. Not too far yeah. from us. Good team. Good yeah. Team. yeah. So yeah, we're doing a crazy Superbird called the Hellion. Um, we're, we've got a kick-ass Mercedes 7300 SEL long wheelbase. Uh, originally a 6.3 car that we did a 6.2 LS9. It's a derelict. And like this interior on this car is nuttier than anything we've ever done. Like there are hundreds of mods, but collectively they are so subtle that unless you've daily driven one of those cars for 10 years, you're not going to call out if I say, okay, what's, what's monkey look? You're going to miss 90% of them. It has four-wheel independent chassis, big board Brembo's, hydro boosted, dry sump, blown, intercooled. It's just a monster with the original silver paint, with like all new zebra wood and the That's German cool. leather yeah. and perps. It's so sexy. I see you using those LS9s all the time. You like that LS9, don't you? I love the LS9. I'm bummed they ran out of them. I bought the last three in captivity that GM had. Um, and now everyone's, you know, LT1 and flooring, which I don't know. I, I too many friends at GM uh, over the years told me the backstory of who drove development on those two different classes of engine. I still prefer the old guard because they let the engineers have just a wee bit more power. So it wasn't about number on a piece of paper. It was about quality durability, like nutty quality inside those LS9s. It's phenomenal motors. So what? yeah, we got a 75 Cherokee that's badass with all hand tool leather interior that I did with some friends in the leather world and uh, CNC grill and all the Brightworks custom down to the typography and font language on the gauges and that's running a Hemi 6.4. Uh, we got a that shit. You guys had Tom Nelson on the show, right? Yeah. Yeah. So we worked with Tom and we did one of his moderate 1100 horsepower, 692 twin turbos. <laughs> nice. In a three door suburban that we recrafted into a four door version. Perfect. Uh, that, that one's coming together. We got a lot of, lot of, lot of projects rolling and then frustrating for me because I'm, I need so many more employees right now. I've got like a stack 
of committed projects that I've already sketched out and started writing my hit list on, you know, I'm dying to get into them, but it's too soon. So like doing a 41 caddy sedan derelict that's got some radical content, 250 GTE Ferrari that we're going to restyle in keeping with the design language and era. Um, Volvo P1800, one of my favorite sort of orphan cool. parts. Yeah, a bunch of bunch of weird shit coming up. Damn. Yeah, that's a- you find there's a lot of, uh, I don't know, customer education involved in getting him into the uh, the Reformer and the Derelict series, or you got guys that are kind of banging on your door wanting this old patinaed uh, hot rod and turn it into something modern. There's no way you're going to see a Derelict client. Either they get it organically and viscerally and they're in, or they're never going to get it. So I don't even try, right? Mm-hmm. The reformer guys, I think once people understand that at, 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 at essence, that the root of what we're trying to do is revisit transportation design from the past in a modern context, and they get their head around, oh, wait a minute, I can have the comforts and perversions of modernity and the performance and the precision of my soulless new car, but wrapped in something with some spirit and culture and, you know, sort of a time machine, so to speak, that's easy. And then either derelict or reformer clients, there's, I think, two distinct classes. One that comes to us and just says, fuck yeah, I love what you guys are doing. This rocks. Look, I'm good at what I do, and that's why I have the funds to be able to come to you. You're good at what you do, your team. That's great. What do you want to build? That's my favorite because then I'll try and talk them into the latest stupid <laughs> idea the that I want to build but can't <laughs> afford to keep, right? Or it's hyper, hyper, hyper personal. It's like my grandfather or my dad or the girl that got away in high school. I remember memories. It was this color this year with this trim and, you know, down to the whatever, you know, some little ephemera that was in it. And then our car hunters, we will hunt down that exact car. And they, they literally, it's, it's a very personal vision and dream. And it's odd, right? But it's a very deep divide. You're either far to that side or far to the other side. There's no loosey-goosey in the middle. We have a lot of the same stuff. Sometimes it sucks. We've hunted down cars. We spent two years trying to find that particular car and can't find the right example. And we have to give up or, you know, modern attention span. Sometimes the client loses interest <laughs> and flies away. For sure. Crazy. And a lot of that's tied to, uh, you know, what was cool in high school, what their parents had, what they had, what their first car was. Yeah. Or what, the movie or whatever. There's or their always first, whatever, that, first time. And, yeah. Yeah. First car they got. Paid. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You hear a lot of those. Like, what, what happened? That's in that, happened that several. Seat. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So out of all these climbing, mean, all these, you had to have had like a standout. You've probably had some, I mean, all kinds of, Celebrity clients, interesting clients. What's the one that jumps out to you? The self-made guys. Yeah. Girls. Very few female clients. The big sausage party. But <laughs> um, self-made. Bootstrap. Got there on their own with their own vision and commitment and passion and ethic. They're always my favorite. Um, I don't know if it's – you know what? He's so cool. He doesn't care. I mean, I got this one client named Noel. And I have several clients like him. There's uh, Tomas. I mean, there, there's several of them. I mean, I'm, I'm really blessed. We, we've got great clients um, who just get it at such a level, you know, like today I came home early and blamed it on y'all, but we're just finishing uh, a derelict Bronco for a guy who has, I think, four icon. Damn. Well, on my own time, I'm making him like a World War II – uh, here's the sample. So like the old, like you'd put on the back of your horse, which inspired like the early Harley design language dudes, like an old saddlebag, yes. right? It's like you hop off the horse and sling it over your shoulder. Yeah, and like a fucking cowboy. Balloon, right? So I, I sourced this oldie and then I'm hand making him one, hand stitched and everything and scratch using the remnants of the bison hide and textile from Relicate that is in his interior. I'm not charging him. I'm not telling him. It's just like, he just, I just, I, I love the love, you know? 
And then unfortunately, occasionally, and you guys have been here, it was a very important moment in my career. And, you know, my wife runs the company with me. Without her, I would have fucked this up years ago. Um, I, I, I was telling my oldest son at the myers Manx event last night, who I took with me, I said, you know, I'm the dog. Your mom is both the leash and the tree. <laughs> she's she's enabled, allowed, enforced, supported, and pulled my crazy ass back in equal number of balance. Good. So yeah, you know, occasionally I have a client and you smell it, right? And earlier in my career, I'd be like, I need the money. I need this job. And I'd be like telling my managers and PMs, my wife, whatever, like, oh, I got this. I'm good with people. Like I, he's he's a little high maintenance, but like we're cool. And they're not cool. Like they just don't get it or whatever. <laughs> you do. So almost 20 years into my career, we had this guy who was just from hell. And, and my wife, in her wisdom, she goes, you know, this only works one way. And that's if, if people love what we're doing for them and the process and and it's a two-way mutual street. And she's like, this is not that, and it's never going to be. And I gulped and drained my bank account. I had three projects in the shop for this one client. One I had just finished, and he wouldn't let me drive. No test drive miles, which I'll never do again either. Yep. Um, mm-hmm. He had a failure with it, and then called me and, like, nasty email CCing counsel and everything. Like, what up, dude? Like, it was a minor, minor issue. Like, that's why we put 700 to 2,000 miles on everything. Yep. But the guy, I, he was so out of control. I, I, I literally almost drained my bank account. I sent a flatbed under the guise that I'm going to pick up that truck and repair that problem. As soon as that truck was loaded on the flatbed, I told my driver, get around the block, walk back, hand him this envelope. And the envelope was a cashier's check, 100% refund for all three come pick up your shit, get out. (laughs) I've only ever had to do that two times in my career, hundreds and hundreds of vehicles. I'm literally almost a thousand projects between the two brands. I hope to never have to do it again. But the second you know you have that power, changes the game. So that COVID, my father passing early this year, I had my right knee replaced, took like a year to recover, my wife during COVID went through a nasty, nasty battle with breast cancer. She almost died in the very beginning. Oh man! All this was like the beautiful thing about negative things that happen in your life. If you really can digest it, you come away with such amazing clarity and your bullshit meter is suddenly way more active. That shit's digital. (laughs) (laughs) So now I smell it going in. If it just doesn't seem like it's going to be right, I'm not going to work to make it right. If a client's super constricted, I'm going to tell them these projects, as much as I'd love to give you a not to exceed or fix, the most I can promise you is professionalism, a properly run business. So, I mean, I've got an MBA, PhD, COO, which is an incredibly rare combination of words. And my wife, that, that, I mean, our PMs, like we, we do massive audits. We do three stops per build to make sure we know exactly where we are. So I tell clients, look, it's a one of one. We're building your dream and we're stoked, but I can't give you a fix. I can tell you an hourly rate. I can tell you my markup on the sublets, management fees, like it is what it is. And I promise you full transparency. But if you can't handle that, and I know it sucks, then I don't know. Like, And if someone's a dick, life's too short. You got to love everyone you work with and work for. That's easy to say, right? Until I'm giving free brake inspections and $29 oil changes because I'm <laughs> fucking market shit. So, <laughs> no, you're, you're, you're I'm able to keep that clarity. And, and it's it's like it's like knowing you're carrying but never drawing. Like, it, yep. it's just power. power. You got to go through some shit to know where, where you're at and what you can do and what you can't do. Yeah, as you're coming up, I mean, you just – you're – any opportunity you have oh, to, dude, hustle, to, to hustle, build right? a car, hustle, get it done, get it done, get yeah. it done. But yeah, you reach a point and, uh, you know, we've worked with some phenomenal customers and you've worked with a handful of not so good ones, but 
the writing's on the wall at this point. I mean, yeah, all the yeah, questions. Sign summer, sign yeah, we've, summer. you know, like, you know, Phil usually is the front line of receiving, you know, the inquiry. And when there is like an Excel spreadsheet with cam specs and it's 72 pages long about this build and Phil shows it to me, I'm like, yeah, we don't need to be doing that. It's got bad news written all over it. Right, or like they, they, they give you the gear ratios of the tranny they want to do yeah. and they don't the it, train mechs it, want to run and they want to tell you why and you're like well yeah and, and you look at it and you're I like you're like that's not, not going to work that sucks that sucks yeah. that's going to break we'll never do that that's going to ride yeah, like yeah, crap yeah. you don't want to do that that's a terrible and you're like yeah so just no it's that's just probably we don't need to go through all that how much to upgrade <laughs> power windows yeah <laughs> oh yeah no like i'm down with power windows i get it but i do i have i we designed our own Arduino, and then we work with new relics for their kick-ass analog style use original sure. cranks jump the shark but i did the thing with that is then you have to become an octopus right especially in a four door to oh, yeah. reach around all the damn right. friends <laughs> so i designed i didn't but i hired again someone smarter than me an electrical engineer and we now you double tap it down or double tap up to up to six windows down for up in chorus nice Love it. <laughs> oh, but, you get those with the guy that's they they're just so they're focused on on the details that don't need to be focused on at that point, you know. And that's when that's that's a telltale sign when it's like, I want to build a '69 Camaro. This is the steering wheel that needs to be in it. Oh yeah. Uh, well, what? all right. Yeah, well, dude. So I just we've went, got a lot of things right. to talk about I, before we get to that point. You know? I, I just went through this, and Phil, you you know what I'm talking about. Uh, me and Phil restored this old boat, a 1971 Magnum. And we kind of hot rodded it, so it's got LS motors and everything. And then I leaned on a, a company out of uh, Michigan, CK uh, Performance Marine, to do like the rigging and make it work because that's what they do. So had some things that were not quite right. Brought it back up to him, and I send oh, the guy. It, well, I send the guy a list of like, all right, I know this guy, and I'm going to get you this part and this part and this part, and I'll send you this because this. And I catch myself, and I'm like wait a minute, I'm doing exactly what I, yep. what I get pissed. I'm like, you know what, dude, I, you have it because you know what you're doing. Just yeah. do it. Zip do, up, yeah. Do what you need to do. I'm going to shut the fuck up now. Yeah, that's not yeah. what I do. Yeah. Tip girl, let it happen. Right. Yeah. But, you know, that's like with Tom Nelson. I'm not going to go to Tom and tell him the lobe spec on the damn cam. I'm going to clearly define, look, the client doesn't want jet fuel, dual tanks, double injectors. He, I don't want to rip a, a, a car in half with fucking torque, <laughs> but I, I I needed to idle in Phoenix in the summer at 8:50 at a light with the AC and not be loping and fuming everyone around him out of the place. Pushing through but the brakes or the converter. I, when, he yeah. pounce, when he pounces on it, he wants Should that go. shit to go. Other than that, I'm gonna shut up, Tom, and I'm gonna yeah. give you the leeway. Now I do expect and need. Unfortunately, a lot of guys in our industry, I think are so passionate they don't realize they are running a business yep. i need a reliable timeline i need a budget i need parameters and i've learned very very hard over the years to clearly define that we just had to pull a car from an upholstery shop guy was doing the best work i frankly have ever seen like a big fan of sid shavers my upholsters worked for me for 20 years solely for me and he's he's overwhelmed and we're like okay well this is a freaky job so let's try out this guy following Instagram. Phenomenal. But we're double the original budget. We're triple the original timeline. And only the carpet, headliner, door cards, and package tray and trunk were trimmed. We still had seats and shit to do. There, there comes a point, right, where I can't keep going to my client who trusts me, parroting what I'm being told when I can't trust what I'm being. It's not even trust. But like the, the guy's such an artist. That he's like, well, I've been doing this for 50 years. And like, it's done when it's done and it's right when it's right. I'm like, bless you. If you found a customer base that can handle that. I can't communicate to my clients like that. I have yep. I, different, not even higher, better. I have different standards. We had, a, we, we had to, with plenty of respect, but we had to pull the car last week. It's, it's like Out. you said, it's sometimes it's things have got to be done. You got to. You, the writing's on the wall with customers and, and, and business structure. Right. And again, I'm not that dude, but I'm smart enough or, and old enough to learn where I suck and create a master alliance of internal staff and sublet partners that 
combined, it's a proper, as proper business, it's just kind of crazy industry ever will be, right? Absolutely. Well, Jonathan, it's been great having you on. We got a few more questions. It's the standard questions. If you you said you've been listening to a few of these, so I hope you came prepared. What's uh, okay. what, what was your very first car and a story about that? Uh, so my very first car was a '55 Ford four door F O D O R, right? Hmm. Bucket of shit baseline car that I hate auction cars. I never buy at auction, except for own dad occasionally when I had too much scotch and yeah. all other people that I don't need. Um, We've got drunk and bought shit on eBay regularly, so <laughs> yeah, your it'll happen. <laughs> but like even eBay, like if I can trick the, the eBay communication and get an actual direct communication with the dude, by the way, great trick. Take a picture with your email and phone number on it and attach it. If you write your email or phone number, eBay blocks yeah. communicate. Yeah, they want all on platform. Move. So that's fine, but no, this was like some stupid auction house, like typical our house, commercial auction house. And I bought it and it was trash. I took it apart and restored it. It was an XG man car, it was fully bulletproof. Wow. But 1950s, Damn. meaning nothing rolled down, no AC, <laughs> no heat. Uh, and that car actually ended up getting stolen. Funnier yet, literally many years later, a tow yard calls me and they're like, uh, you need to come pick up your vehicle. And I'm like, looking outside, looking, I have a one car garage for a long driveway. And I'm like, mm, 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 mm. I'm looking at the shop cameras. Okay. Everything's cool. Shop. So I'm like, I'm not missing any cars. He's like, Oh, well. I'm like, what is it? I'm like, you're fucking kidding. Me. <laughs> and it was in the exact same condition. Years later is when I stole it or when he stole it. I got it back. That's why. Uh, so that was, that was the beginning uh, at the end. And then, um, uh, I, I had uh, had some liquid money and I was driving all these unreasonable, old, unreliable cars as my mom saw it. And my parents bullied me. I, I found a Chairs and Flares Dino, original paint, gorgeous. Now, this is before Enzo died. The car was $27,000, I still remember. I told my dad, I'm like, I'm going to go buy this. You know, I got some cash, you know. I got to go get it. My dad's like, that's absurd. You're 17 years old. You, you don't deserve it. You have no right, but you need to just go buy a new car, buy something practical, something reasonable. So I went and bought like a 325 BMW convertible, like every other little yuppie schmuck. <laughs> <laughs> so then, then Enzo was died. Was it red? No, I wasn't that bad. Was it was champagne. Red. It was like probably Come champagne on. with a cream. I just go back to, you ever watch PCU, the movie? No. Ah, uh, there's a great. That's a, yeah, that's a deep pull. That's a good flick. <laughs> hey, look, though, in my defense, I put proper BBSs on it, basket, nice. and I went to Steve. I went to Diamond, and I dialed that thing in a little bit. So, you know, a little bit of respect. I, I, yeah, I, right, I, right. I get maybe a half a point. <laughs> but anyway, I go to sell that car. It's worth 15 grand. The exact same Dino that I was told was not a reasonable car to get, 300 grand sold. Yeah. <laughs> so I, I've, I've given up... Uh, I am no longer a big believer in rational thought. Follow me back. <laughs> but my, again, my taste exceeds my budget. So, you know, we're self-financed. So we pretty much pour all our money right back into the company to make it bigger and stronger. So I have several cars, but there's a longer list of cars I've yet to own that uh, I definitely want to click those boxes at some point. Got to find the right customer. That's right. Yeah. Then I just drag out the test drive as long as reasonable. <laughs> oh, yeah. And Wait. then my last ditch line is always, well, Leno's not, you know, able to, he, he wants it on the show, but he can't do it for two months. So like, <laughs> pull up a delay we found that we've got to put 7,500 miles on these things before we yeah, deliver them. Yeah, it's only <laughs> right thing to do. It does. There's a show in seven years we want to bring it to. <laughs> Let's just. It does help get them out of your system though. I mean, because yeah. you've got to go, we, we push for 500 miles on the stuff that we yeah. we're test drive in it before we deliver it. And you get your fix for like, it, it works both ways because I've never been like an El Camino fan, but we did a 71 El Camino for uh, George Lothers. And I'm like, man, I'd never wanted one before, but shit, now I kind of want one. So it's like right at that amount of mileage where it either like fucks you and you, right. s you, wanna you want to go it. out and get one or, it's like, or you, you know get what? it out of your system. Done with this. Yeah. Like the crazy? Nova, you know? I always blows my mind how many shops in the industry don't. But like you guys have learned, like I have, 
the, the most important feedback was from myself and my own fabricators and builders and staff and everything. And I don't care if it's catastrophic or an annoying rattle that takes 500 miles locate and excise. You want to talk about yeah. rattle? I try oh, doing an been, electric, been <laughs> Try doing a derelict electric 49 Mercury. I can talk about rattle. <laughs> oh my god! Did the place has that killer. There's that archaic British tool of all sources for a good tool. Um, it's it's microphones on like 16 channels with a little circuit board and cheesy earphones, and oh. you can roach clip and tape the magnets on your chassis and all over the car. And you, you, it's got like a little grease marker and you can go through each circuit to the earphones it is the best thing ever. I've owned that tool for like 20 years. It's the we, best rattle we might, hunter. We might need to get that. I've put myself in some very unusual positions. Yeah. Hey, we've chasing, around with you in the trunk several times. Yeah, chasing. I mean, oh, totally. what, what you swear is the front license plate rattling yeah. ends up being the fucking tailpipe. Yeah. Right. I mean, the way that the, the yeah. I mean, it, it's you can never track it. Then we'll spend countless hours, but we will not let it we go. We caught I mean, it in that Impala on the road. Oh tour. my god! How many times? We every stop we made. What did it end up being? I was gonna. I thought you were. I was gonna ask you. It was. Uh, oh, it was the exhaust uh, uh, isolators. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. We swore it was. Dude, we swore which we which Impala 30, was We it? put thirty five hundred miles on this car. The in, bubble top in a, a, about a week on a road trip and we left out of here uh the three of us phil was driving his truck me and jeremy were in the impala um and we left out about probably two o'clock in the morning to head to nashville um and we get about an hour we get well we get through the city and we get on to 65 south and uh we're rolling and all of a sudden you hear that <laughs> And every now and then, that, oh that little God. bit of a parrot squeak, you know? And it wasn't, you very quickly realized you couldn't replicate anything in it. It wasn't a harmonic, it was just... You're grabbing <laughs> panels and rolling windows. Oh, yeah. And yeah, we ended up... Stuff. Yeah, oh, yeah, I'm hanging out the door, like, leaning under. We ended up stopping at a Harbor Freight. We got pry bars and a jack because we decided there was something on, like, a hat channel that must have been just barely rubbing the chassis. We shimmed the whole fucking body. Yeah, all Remember the body that? mounts loose. Thinking and that were that's, you right? Were you no, right? No, no, we were. But I, I, I had it in my mind. I'm like, hundred percent. We spent that's, two hours that's in what a parking it is. lot doing it, and it was one of those things. Like you said, you have psyched yourself up that now you finally found it because we've that's stopped. It. I got it. Well, as soon as we pull out, we were like, "Oh, I dude, I think first we got bump. it." And it's <laughs> first bump. <laughs> like, oh, you, you gotta be <laughs> fucking kidding me. Do you, you remember what it was? It, it ended up being an one exhaust isolator. Oh, that, the, yeah, was, the rubber, the oh. isolator for the hanger. Um, Isn't it crazy? Talk about a commoditized product. How many shit exhaust hangers are out there? Blows oh, mind. yeah. I've, every time I see them, like, people post pictures, and I'm like, that's going to melt. That's never going to – because those, like, the little donut ones, you know, yeah. that you fold over. And paper and gas. You, you can get the blue ones. ones. The blue ones are high heat, right? <laughs> I use those ridiculously yeah. expensive V-Glam, you know, the V-Clamp Turbo with the flanges you take on for yeah. all exhaust couplings now. Yep. I have zero patience for paper gaskets. I'm like, oh, no, yeah. that's done. Yep. Done enough stock restos, I'm not dealing with that shit. Yep. So now it's all the V-Grooves and like uh, Deets, I think, is the guy in Burbank who makes really good hangers and nice isolators. We had an FJ44. This was the worst soul-sucking, hour-burning <laughs> rattle we've ever chased. Truck was entirely built and done. I go to shoot. I shoot a YouTube video on every single part. Of the I think hey, you guys are awesome. Damn. Damn. Thank you. I'm back. <laughs> Who's left? Um, it got to the point. We literally split the body at the A pillar. Did like a plywood rig in a bucket for a seat position. Yeah. And drove it with just the cow on, no body. <laughs> 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 I mean, that's how far we dug down. And we tried simpler and simpler stuff. Okay, shit, maybe it's in the soft top frame. Uh, nope, okay, stripped out. Nope, that's not it. Okay, well, shit, maybe it's the hood hinges. Maybe the bushings got baked too hot. Okay, let's try that. No. Ended up with just a cowl on a running chassis with full wiring. You know what it turned out to be? Inside of the damn body, there was like a Sawzall rough trim, or it may have been laser, but they had misaligned. So there was like a quarter inch by 12 inch tong of 
five sixteenths aluminum and the inner body structure that was welded up and sealed and hidden. Oh, and good. it was like a tuning fork. So at oh. certain, <laughs> certain vibrations, it could start doing its thing. Oh, it's it amazing. Certain- the vibrations and the rattles are unbelievable. The, the like extent we go to eliminate them. And then we had, every once in a while, there's an anomaly. We had a car come into the shop. It was on one of our chassis. And it was like a homemade deal. And I think I was having some issue with something. We told him we'd take care of it. So it, like a F100, early like 50s F100. And he bolted the transmission, didn't put the poly mount in it, bolted it direct to metal. The motor, he directly bolted, somehow the left the motor mounted. mounts on. The exhaust yeah. is solid mounted, oh touching YouTube, everything. Uh, the, YouTube. The, YouTube. Yeah. Oh yeah, the cab yeah. The was cab solid. was in like thirty different spots. Solid mounted. The transmission is oh. laying on every portion of the sheet metal. The steering- that's like when guys want me to do full full chromoly cages, and I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like the only way that's done right, I have to unitize your chassis, your cage, and your body, and get rid of all the polys. And I'm like, it's gonna shake your molars out. Oh yeah. Well, and well, well it. It, doesn't, it doesn't Dude, necessarily you'd, have to. You'd be surprised. The steering the sh- shaft is laying on the headers. Every single possible thing where you know you go to great lengths to not do was done. I get in this thing. I'm like, I, this is going to be a absolute train wreck. I get get in it, start it up. It's like getting into a fucking Rolls Royce. It's like the new I mean, Maybach. I mean, it's, you, it doesn't you, make it. dead silent <laughs> rides. Everything canceled each other out. It was ro- the smoothest road. Ro- so good. <laughs> like, I'm like, luck. I'm like how yeah. the fuck is Absolutely. this happening right now? Un- the other oh, favorite client, I know you guys love the guy who calls and he's like, you tell him how long. He's like, what? It's like, well, I watched, I saw on that show and that show, like oh, the reality yeah. car builder show references. I just like, no. Yep. That and when people want their, their, their driver they're driving input on design as they want diamond stitch. I have never once <laughs> diamond done diamond stitch. stitch. I will never do diamond stitch. It's become like an in-house joke when a client mm-hmm. like reference some IG photo from another builder and like, especially in a Bronco, like, dude, diamond stitch, yeah. it's, not, it's not a 90s Bentley. What are we doing? Like, no, that's always a, a red flag to me. And I'm always like, the maybe diamond it's stitch. I'm like, not happening, not doing diamond yeah, We've been for, we've avoided the diamond stitch we've never, never I've talked done to it. embossing and I've made my own. We've seen see own embossing plates. That's good fun to that do really cool. cool patterns. Um, so embossing laser surfacing leather is super fun and you can do neat stuff. It's hard to get the stink out, but lavender spray does it. Huh. Good way to only get laser stink out of a leather. Otherwise just burn. Smells flat. burnt. Yeah. I usually I'll get them into a creative leather and talk them out of it. But honestly, I think if it was a deal breaker, I'd walk from the job. Like it's just, on, on a diamond, <laughs> on the diamond <laughs> stitch. Not the an di- underglow. No. Oh, no. Yeah, hey, no, we, we just we, an underglow. we just revisited the underglow. We did this eighty-eight squ- uh, OBS. All eighties. All right, 80s well, if I'm wrong on so. anything, to pull it off. It'll be an eighty. Yeah, it was, so it's it's all it's Miami Vice, you know, top to bottom. So it worked on that. But yeah, the. Diamond stitch is funny when you look at it in the marine world too. Every single boat manufacturer, I mean, like a huge upgrade. Oh yeah, it's like it, that is a luxury option. Oh, I'm surprised. I'm surprised Jonathan's so against it. I mean, Tony Nancy had it in every seat, every yeah. dragster seat, didn't he? Every one of his seats was diamond. Diamond, diamond tufted versus diamond stitch. Okay, yeah, a, little a, different, different. a little different. Yeah, yeah, that's one defense. And you know, if if it's a, if it's a top fuelie and it's total geek out, it's a whole different thing. Right, you're right. You know, you, if you add that into a daily driver, to me, it's a stylistic relevance that really is only appropriate in a very small list of obscure cars. I don't know, whatever. I am maybe I'm but just it, an opinionated it, ass. It also it also says that the the wife likes nice things. You know, <laughs> the diamond stitch. Yeah, the diamond, the diamond <laughs> stitch says what the wife wants in yeah. the. You maybe know, I should we, try we, that angle. Well, and say, I'll make your wife a diamond stitch purse. We cool? Yeah. I'm not there you go. <laughs> That's a better diplomatic man. answer. Yeah. <laughs> Perfect. Keep it out of the yeah. car. <laughs> uh, now, this is going to be a little bit different from you having a Hollywood background. Uh, what's the best car movie, in your opinion, and why? I mean, I'm probably every other idiot said it, but, I mean, Bullet just nails so many – ridiculous stunts well, and absurdity well, it's, but, it's it's up there it's but not, it's not as high as you would think but it, it's up there but it's not like, as high and it's, to me, it's also not just the star cards 
it's the moment in time. It's the, the cars in the background. It's, 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 it's that moment in time in the Bay area at, of that era. There's, it's, there's so much of it. Also, I, I know you don't ask it and it's an obscure thing to bring up, but have you guys ever heard of the little known, uh, automotive book called cars on the street no no it's phenomenal no. so it, it was a, an american infantryman in europe during world war ii who was stationed i honestly i i, I don't know he, he might have been doing more like spy work stuff because he was he was in munich he was in london he was in paris was like in all the global centers of europe at the time and a car goober with the killer camera so he would take pictures of like figioni falashi Talbot Lagos, Bugattis, Buccialis, Avion Voissons, like super crazy, weird shit, Peugeot sixes, and just but like we're daily drivers at the time, like just parked on the street. And you know what? I retract bullet. It's not really <laughs> okay. the move. <laughs> okay. But there's a famous old video you can dig up on YouTube that the story went that it was a cinematographer. An enlisted man who stole the camera off the base, one of the gyro mount cameras from the military. And I think it's a, is it a 275 or it might've been a GTO. You ever seen that black and white footage? Early morning in Paris, balls out. No. Oh my no. God, you guys haven't seen is, it? Well, is, we it, is see it through that. the, it's through yeah. the streets? Like, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, like, I have seen it. Have sideways seen it. around the Octa Triumph and, like going through intersections, balls out. It's almost like, like POV in a way. Yeah. Okay. And it's like the end, POV like and balls running out. up to meet the hottie uh, at the base of the stairs of the statue and yes. the pigeons flying away. Yeah. And the audio on it, phenomenal. That's, that's, a, that's, a, good, that's a good call. That's a good call. <laughs> that's so good. It's like uh, it's like the original Ronin. Like uh, yeah. if yeah, you've yeah, ever I'm watched gonna, any of the Ronin, check you know, that the, one out. That's cool. Uh, oh, everyone who's listening and you cats, you got to look that up. It's and the sound on it's phenomenal. Apparently, the audio is bullshit, and they looped it in later. But I don't care. I love it. Yeah, it's just a great watch. Yeah, it's awesome. Uh, your favorite SEMA story? <laughs> One year at SEMA. It's better than Josh's. It will never be beat. <laughs> One year at SEMA, me and a very, very well-known automotive journalist and a couple other goober friends of ours started a like text train of we created our own SEMA awards and it was it was more like the Rotten Tomato Awards. It was like the <laughs> word of, of course the rims gave us the best, you know, they kind of dominated the, yeah, the final it's award. An easy one. But it was us kind of like covertly trying to be cool and making sure no one's looking, just taking pictures of the most, are you kidding me? I can't believe you did that. Or worse yet, I can't believe you invested all of your money into bring what to market. Like that kind of stuff. Um, and the runner up would be Farley at Ford. We had worked together at Toyota. And then, you know, Farley went over and was CMO, I think, and, you know, before he became CEO of Ford. But, you know, they'd always wanted, of course, to bring back the Bronco. So Farley had reached out to me when he landed at, at Ford and said, Hey, man, have you ever thought about doing your icon thing on a Bronco? I was like, hell yeah. And it's like the number one or number two most requested build. And he's like, well, would you guys like build us one for SEMA? And I'm like, well, let's define that because I'm not into like bling, bling, chrome, underglow, all that sort of uh, look at me show stuff. I said, but I want to build an icon Bronco. Like, hell yeah. And like, I don't need any money. I'll pay for it. But I need engineering support. You know, we, we needed some back end for the Coyote because this is very early pre crate coyote days, etc. So we sent in a proper presentation and uh, we did sexy renders and the usual stuff and everything. They greenlit it. And suddenly like, I can't get an email back from them as SEMA approaches. I'm like, it's done, I guess ready. So I'm like, I don't like chasing, especially big corporate and elephants and mice and the, the whole analogy. So I was like, whatever. So I committed to it being on a booth with one of my suppliers and like, good to go. But I did bring another car in the semi just in case it was like a backup. So I'm, I'm, I stay at the Renaissance there. So like, I love it. It's like a little oasis right in the parking lot. 
no hose and because you know casino machines good bar the right scotch i'm in and netflix so i'm looking out the window our truck is unloading remember when they used to do it in that gold lot or whatever yeah. and i'm as i see it coming off they're literally like a dozen suits surrounding the ramp as the guys bringing it down i watch one guy break away get on his phone my phone rings it's one of the bosses at Ford. And he's like, honestly, we didn't think this was going to happen. Like, we, you have no idea how many renderings we get and promises. And like, we didn't think from our city a Coyote could fit, uh, you know, and on and all the reasons of why it's not going to exist from smoke and mirrors and promises made. I'm like, no, I told you I was going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. So they're like, well, can we, can we, can we feature it on the booth? And I like, I just, sure, that'd be an honor. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if you've got, so if you've funny got to space. Like, be like, we, on have, the we have a couple of commandments, <laughs> but. Uh, yeah, a block. I mean, what am I going to do? I'm not going to school them on their culture. It's not going to change over <laughs> my time. But, um, That's cool. yeah, I mean, all joking aside, we ended up, we've had a really long, great relationship with Ford over the years. Uh, I consulted on the design for the new Bronco for over five years, which is, again, totally different culture than my design work with other OEMs. And very interesting to be involved in that process. I I'm glad I got my own little world and I don't deal with focus groups and bless them, the design team, for the patients to hold the line and keep the, the design DNA as on track as they did with the Bronco. I think it came out killer. Yeah, they did a great job with it. Yeah. I I you're right. I can't. I can't imagine being in those, like you said, focus groups on the tweaks I've that people enough. that the people that shouldn't be making some of those calls, trying to make those calls, and then those the engineers and the designers being like, and the people who should be making those calls. But mo most <laughs> most engineers and designers that we've come across have a very unique ability to just let it roll off their back or act like they didn't hear what you just said. They're people persons, right? Well, no, that's not the problem, though. Those guys, it's the mandates that come from upper brass that don't necessarily get it. You know, I've had many friends uh, at top OEMs and designers, and, like, everyone, if, from the dude who's doing the, the scution to the sun visor to the IP to the fascia or whatever, like, they all have a common goal, and even if they're on multiple continents, like, it's cohesive. It gets 95% done. And then what? They bring in a focus group full of people that are cool to get like free donuts and crappy coffee and a Target gift card to wax poetic who don't know, they don't know shit. Right. And then the brass and the external marketing company then comes to the design team with a rolling list of changes. I know a lot of guys that have left our industry and gone to Nike or to other industries or other smaller companies because it gets so damn frustrating. You know the first car, by the way, to, to, to use a focus group as if that's not enough proof in the pudding of it didn't work and it should have never Toyota been Previa. I'm going to go oh, Mustang no. too. No, dude, the Previa, the Previa was obviously like all the top. <laughs> yeah, they broke the mold when they made that. In the fucking world on that. I think the Previa might have been designed by the PTA. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> no. <laughs> Yeah, and, along with Formula One. Yeah. Like, Edsel. And whoever made the Nerf Edsel, Turbo football. The Edsel was the first focus group. That explains yep. everything. Mm. Yep. But, like, we didn't learn from that. Like, what are we doing? Yeah. I don't know. It had a lot of cool individual parts and pieces. Yeah, the, yeah. Tail, the tail lights on the, was it the yeah. Voyager? What do they call that? You ever, the see, the Edsel, ever see the Edsel Cheros? Mm -mm. There, there was a dealer in Northern California back in the day that – Started an Edsel dealership and he was screwed. No one was buying him. The toilet bowl grill jokes and everything were abundant. He could not get rid of them. And the 57, I guess it was, right? Rancheros also were not selling for shit. They were so much more expensive than the pickup platform and didn't have the utility. Yep. Never heard this story. You got to no. Google. So this dealer took Edsels and took Rancheros and he cobbled them together. So he took the front bench seat. The full IP gauges, dash, I think door cards and trim and armrest, front clip and rear quarters, I think from the, I forget which Edsel, Sedan or maybe, I don't remember which one, 
But anyway, cobbled them together and they're cool as hell. Like huh. I saw one and learned the story at a Central Coast dealership maybe 30 years ago and looked into it. It was such a such a weird those, thing. I could, those guy actually are pretty it. fucking cool. Let me see. Right? It's it's such a freak, but it works better than either of the cars did in their stock. Oh, form. that is that is great. I mean, the the fifty seven Rancher was a pretty cool. Yeah, looking. I agree, but the they car. were struggling marketing. Yeah, because it, it looks it, good with the Edsel grill in it. Yeah, huh? it's got a cool. That was look. that was ag country, so like they wanted a pickup truck that could work. They didn't sure. want something that rode like a car and give a shit. They need a work truck. I want to yeah, do a Koei one day. I've still yet to do a Koei. There's oh, so many employees oh, oh. I'm in love with. What is that? Cab over engine. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, we've got, me and Phil, impulse. Hey, drunk purchase. eBay purchase. <laughs> yeah. We paid twice the amount to ship it here than the actual initial purchase was. Yeah, it was that cheap. fucking awesome. It's though. sitting out in the what, yard. What model? What is it? I think it's like a 73 Ford uh, yeah, but it, with a short box uh, box, short, uh, short bed box on it. So it's like a six foot, uh, like a U-Haul box, basically. But it says what? <laughs> ga- Gazamat? Gazamat? Yeah, all original, like cool. It's got like a lightning bolt graphic. It was some gas company's thing. Dude, it's, it's it's fucking tits. Oh, it's fucking awesome. And we have, you know, we've came up with all these ideas of what we're going to do with it. But it just says. I want to take an old trailer, like an Airstream or ideally something more niche, like pre-Airstream. And I want to, I want to, I want to. I want to build an RV that's a Koei snubbed with a pass through to a vintage trailer on, cool. on a, a modern uh, chassis. That'd this, be so much fun. This one we've fun. got is the is the exact truck that you see wreck or run into the back of like the farm truck in every Chips episode, like in the opening <laughs> scene of the Chips when it's that, when the truck yeah. that can't stop on the interstate. Yeah, it's that truck. Uh, yeah. Uh, all right. Well, we. Should be at the very last question, the one everybody's waiting for. However, we're going to slide one more in there. If you don't want to answer yeah. this, we'll cut this out. However, I know that I and as well as Jeremy and Phil are interested to know what is the significance in the Nike swoosh on all of your icon badges on the Broncos. Well, um, it's it's uh, many many years ago. Um, Nike. Let me think. How did it? How did it start? I think. Okay, that's what it was. Nike, I think they still do this up in Beaverton, Oregon. They're their crazy campus. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's nuts. Um, they used to do, and I think they still do, design shows. So they take all their design teams from all their different divisions. They bring them all to headquarters. And it is so cool. And they're all geeks. And it's it's not like, what's Adidas doing? What's Under Armour doing? No, it's like, some batshit crazy water skis. It's audiophile gear. It's extreme. I mean, it's whatever. It's industrial design across all segments of just shit they did. So they invited, they were fans of our brand. The CEO at the time, Mark Parker, apparently in one day was doing design reviews of different teams. And coincidentally, there were elements of, of my designs of different vehicles in three different inspiration boards in three different departments. And he's like, who, what the hell, what is this icon thing? Like, what's going on? Then he, he they told him a little bit. And then uh, we got invited to go to that design show. And in a very topical conversation, uh, he said, you know, if you ever have a project where you could benefit from our kitchen resources, which is like their batshit underground top secret. Yes. Like they have Haas machines in there that if you call it Haas and say, I want a twin head, five axis vacuum table, six by 12 girth, super speed. They'd be like, what? We don't make this. The Nike's got like six of them in a row. This it's is like their no skunk outfit. work. They don't call it skunk works, but that's yeah. their skunk works. Yeah. Where, I mean, they're doing, they're doing DARPA. They're doing all sorts of crazy shit in there. And all the way through to their own premier retail fixtures and knobs and great, incredible, talented team of guys. This is good. You know, we, we have a lot of turnover in there because a lot of it's such advanced product that it never makes it to market and it's just disheartening for this kind of creator. So if you ever have a project that like we could maybe play with you on and help you with that could go from concept to physical in under a year, let us know. So after I got that call from Farley on the Bronco, 
my little brain's going, I'm going to connect some dots. So I, I called and I said, you remember when you said, you know, if you're serious, <laughs> like I got that exact project. So Camilo Pardo and I would do all the design work 2D, then 3D, then print using Nike's printers at the time. He'd FedEx them down to us. We'd bolt that door handle on the car, stand back, stare at it. It's like, ah, it needs a little more surface tension. We bondo it up, we carve it or shave it down or monkey it, FedEx it back to Nike. They'd scan it, mob the file, do next iteration. Um, textile science, um, zipper resource for the marine ykks i'm pretty specific about gauge and resilience and all that so they were development partners on the bronco so as in acknowledging that we just subtly put that swoosh on the body tags uh it's cool in the engine bay and they've been they remain friends and partners to this day and cooler still uh, several nike execs over the years have, have also become icon owners which is cool that's and, awesome cool yeah, I just bought my first pair of Jordans the other day. So that's Did you? Cool. Yeah, Nike. Are you? Yeah, yeah, I'm stepping up. You know, I, yeah. How about that? What? Get after it. Yeah. You, you wait for the weirdest times to slide shit that's like fucking, that in. We're talking about okay. Nike. It's a perfect time. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. They sent me some crazy one-off Nikes, and we were with the ACG group going to do an Icon Nike collab. And then, unfortunately, the, the leadership in that department left. Therefore, when the new dude came in, he wanted nothing to do with the old dude's pet project. So it was stillborn. But it did mm -hmm. get just enough through that I have the one and only pair in the whole wide world down to the box design in my size. And I just, I can't wear them. Like, that's too special, right? Yeah, that's, so that's, like, yeah. yeah you gotta put those customized. suckers on eBay, man. That big yeah, body. I was gonna say, put that shit on eBay. They will use the old That's retirement money. Like, prototype shoes like they did those crazy delorean shoes and they sent me a pair and they were super cool but my humble opinion they're like i'm not gonna wear patent silver shoes i'm just not that dude <laughs> so like i i actually called my friend who sent it sent them to me and Nike, i'm like it's so kind of you and like i know like the world is freaking out for these shoes but like they're so not me man i'm not gonna wear them like i'll send them back to you like give them someone he's like no like we're not even set up for them like don't worry about it just keep them <laughs> like well i'm never gonna wear them let's do put them on ebay I'm like, really? I'm like, that seems really uncool, man. They're a gift. He goes, honestly, I don't care. Put them on eBay. Holy shit. I sold them. They sold for like 2,900 bucks. <laughs> like a month, a month later, everyone's telling me what an idiot I was because they were selling for like six grand. Oh, my oh, God. Wow. Hey, that shoe game's crazy. That's, that's crazy. Uh, nuts. Uh, but now it comes to uh, some of the very final questions and ones we ask everybody. What's I don't believe you anymore. <laughs> what's the best uh, Josh talks out his ass pretty much most of the time what's the best piece of advice that you've ever been given don't step on your own dick that's pretty good that's a my, good ever one. So, my ever so eloquent grandfather <laughs> told me that many 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 years ago <laughs> and I think his point is so many of us um, we get in our own way um when I speak at design schools or colleges or to youth groups or whatever, a big, a big thing that I always push that's an attempt to be slightly more socially acceptable than don't step on your own dick. <laughs> is respect like don't respect. like toes. You can say toes. Like, right? <laughs> oh, my, my, my thing, my go to is re respect your perspective. You know, it's, it's your unique way of seeing the world. And I don't care if you're going into healthcare and you have a perspective on caring for humans and or how to approach curing them or engineering solutions that are alternate approach um, through to if you're going to a top design school. So many times our educational system and even like the, the, the narratives parents tell their kids tries to get people to conform and fit in these social silos that again, I, I truly believe are broken. You as an individual are unique in this world. You can't help it. The more you identify, embrace, have respect for others, but understand your unique way of doing or seeing whatever it is you love or intend to do or how you want to change the world. Honoring that to me is like foundational for happiness in your life. You're, you're going to be less of an asshole to everyone else because you're more connected to what matters to you. Therefore, I think you're easier to love and to love others. 
and the happier you're going to be if, if you can turn that into your career or your passion and you didn't make compromises or or let the school brainwash you into fitting into the cubicle formula of what's employable and you can follow your own dream yeah respect your perspective uh, wholeheartedly cool. yeah i like that we've, we've you know another we had another guest on it talked about what you the only thing you have is you um and that's very it taking the uh I guess having the balls to be comfortable in your own skin and realize that just because your view might be different than the rest doesn't mean it's wrong or any different. That is, that's a superpower, not a hindrance because you might look at something different. Totally. But in counterpoint, don't get to thinking you're a superhero because we're all human. You, you need to be as aware of what you're great at as what you suck at and what you're insightful at versus what you're shallow in. And, and fine, explore and learn and teach yourself those things or build out a team of other people with those abilities. You, you're never going to be everything. And I used to have to be just like you guys did right when you started, man, it was seven days a week. It was deposit to payroll, deposit to payroll, I was killing myself. Fortunately, as the brand grew and we were met with some success over the years, I started to have the ability to stop and sit and go, okay, let's say I wear 15 hats a day. How many of those hats actually fit me? Or I don't look like a doofus, you know, whatever it is, but like really trying to step back and travel is really important to me um, for gaining perspective and stepping back or new designs or whatever it is, right? But like really identify where, where, where you're working best and not fighting yourself. When I had to use, do finance and structure and spreadsheet shit and like for me, left brain, right brain transition is extremely hard. It's like, cobwebs fire up the generator power down that brain of the app it's exhausting at the end of the day i suck that i'm trying to juggle all this stuff now i'm blessed I, I can do the things that i'm more capable of than the things that i've completely walked away from and trusted others to strengthen you know what was a big turning point with me was was allowing myself to take pride in how humble i can be yeah, dude, that's you're honestly, thing, that's me and Phil talk thing. about it. <laughs> hey, me and Phil talk about it all the time. We're like, Josh is the most humble. If you can dude, take when is that going to kick in? If you can take met. pride in how humble that you can be, that I'm telling you, that's that you're on a different level yeah. there. Because I'm super proud of how humble that I can be. No, dude, 100%. <laughs> like, I mean, an example of that would probably be the last text message that I got from you. We went to a, a concert last <laughs> night and. Let's see. What if? I, what do I? What do I get? Oh, I we look, went to a really good <laughs> concert. Last yeah. Night, by the way, I look really big, so adjust accordingly. No, you said. <laughs> you said. You said. What shirt are you wearing? And I told you the shirt, and I said, FYI, I look really big. Really big. <laughs> so adjust accordingly. Right. No, so it's been a really small shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> some of the challenges that life's dealt me in the last three years have really helped me grow and realize it's time to divorce it's time for a divorce from my own ego so i, I i'm now I, and i and i think ego and pride can be often confused i'm very proud of what i do and my team does but even more than me but i'm not an egotist and i this new consciousness from my experience of like i'm not doing i'm not, i don't need to prove anything to anyone just like you guys don't so you, you, you stick to your passion and you do it for the love of it and the pride of it and the quality of it. You don't need to prove anything to anyone else. That makes life so much easier when, when you can say no or say, you know what? I'm really not that good at that. You should call so-and-so. He rocked that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's Before something you definitely, as you mature in, in the industry, really, you get. Right. Was it weird going to a concert after COVID years of not being in crowds? And who'd you go see? Uh, it was good. So, yeah, we've been to a handful of concerts since the COVID thing. Right after COVID, it was super weird. But we went to see Charlie Crockett last mm -hmm. night in Milwaukee, who, I mean, it was absolutely awesome. It's basically like warping back into the, time travel. Into, the, time into travel. the 50s and watching uh, Hank it. Sr. It's I just got to see uh, so Chris Gibbleton cool. recently. And my God, what an honest talent, his whole band, like no bullshit, no theatrical, just raw talent, man. He rocked it. I forgot how much I love concerts. Oh yeah. So good. And that was what this is. I mean, just a dude and his guitar and yep. that's it. No bullshit. Just 
badass. Yeah. yeah it was, it was, I got it was to really see uh, Johnny Cash with June Carter and the whole. Did you really? Wow. Yeah. That's the shit. Will, Dude. Many years ago, it was his last concert. And I'm so happy to have had that. Oh, that is, that's an experience. I'm a big Cash fan. That's that's really awesome. That's awesome. Alan Jackson's a client. I need to I've seen him. I've seen Alan, Alan I Jackson. I hear he's really good. I've never seen him. Yeah. We, seen we, him sang, before, but... we sang the shit out of Alan oh, Jackson. Oh, yeah. We came night. home listening to all 90s country, just fucking cranking it, man. Yeah, I all saw the way Travis, back. Tritt. Travis Tritt at a private birthday party in Austin that was incredibly under-attended. Really? And it was literally me with one of my flasks sharing <laughs> things of whiskey with, with Travis and dad on my left Damn. So I from Travis for two hours nonstop. And oh, that's awesome. It. it was so cool. Sweet. That's very cool. It's Did you get great. a flannel by any chance? Say what? Did you get a flannel by any chance? No. One of the Dixon flannels? No, I didn't go that far. Does, does he uh, have Josh them? didn't either. Yeah, I was wearing my proper handmade alligator boots. My uh, buddy. <laughs> there you go. Does Travis straight have a Dixon? They did a special. Uh, did they really? Yeah. And Josh didn't get it, and he's been really, really busted Is that ever why since. you've been sour about that, the, the Dixon thing? I'm not sour. I just said fuck off to Dixon. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not sour at all about <laughs> yeah, it. Yeah, that doesn't sound sour even. No, I don't even think about it until somebody brings it up. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's funny you say that, though, Paul, because literally directly to the right of this stage was General Lee. Really? Oh. The General Lee? Yep, or one of the many one of the yeah. many generalities. <laughs> it, 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 it was a Dukes of Hazards. Uh, what did what did the invite say? The invite was hysterical. It said, uh, "Masks off, boots on." <laughs> it, was a, it was a Dukes of Hazard themed 50th birthday party. It was damn fun. Damn. Uh, and last but not least, Jonathan, it's been absolutely amazing. But it's time for you to do a pocket dump. What is in your pockets tonight? The lighter. The old big man after shop keys because I always lose them with my uh, Apple tracker and I hand me oh, the leather wrap. Nice. And then I am a bit of a knife geek. So I Ooh, hand what are you rocking? So I hand me the alligator uh, case for it because their cases suck, although their knives are magical. Is that a William Henry? Yes. Good eyes. Nice. Good nice. <laughs> Vintage uh, William oh, Henry. Man. Bad ass. Dude, Super that cool. is yeah, that really nice. That's and some... I beat the piss out of it, but I've got strokes and Japanese stones, and because of my leather craft, I, I I hand skive and hand cuttering. So like I studied in Japan how to properly tune my knives. So I like I cut open Amazon boxes with this baller knife. Oh like, hell yeah, <laughs> dude! So far, Jesse James had probably a, a pretty good pull with the Marfione. Yeah. Other uh, than that, it's been a bunch of you know like yeah. Uh, Gerber knives and I'm surprised bucks. Jesse didn't pull one of his own knives he made. Yeah, that is. Yeah, he was rocking the Marfion. Oh, he was. Oh, 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 yeah, yeah, with the, the Makumagami blade. The yeah, 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 but yeah. that's that dude. You could be in the number one spot with that. That's a that's fucking badass. I'm telling blade you, right any, there, man. I any like that. possible percentage points that you may or may not have lost with the the BMW 3 Series. Gained, gained it back. You yeah. gained them all yeah, yeah. back. He's up. Yeah. Yeah. Did I get any bonus points for having made my own belt? Oh, that's pretty sweet. Is that a turtle shell? What is it? Yeah, my, my buddy cast that. Uh, Damn. Dude. He made yeah. that, and then it's an alligator belt veg line that uh, I hand dyed. Oh, that's pretty well, sick. I actually just I saw know. your. Uh, I love the bright pedal belt yeah, that you're doing. Fun. Dude, the, and I'm it's. Hoping- they're so identifiable. You know it's Ford, like, you know, the Mustang, yeah. the Bronco. The and it's cool endless, shit. right? Like 57 Cadillac. Oh, that'd be a big belt. Oh, with the, yeah, with yeah. the little power brake. 40 Ford, vintage Willis Gasser. Like, there's so many cool pedals. When you start, yeah. you know, like me, I start now I'm thinking about it as belt buckles. I'm at car shows. And let, I'm us, like, let us know when you make some of those before they go live so we can get our hands on some yeah, of those. Yeah, we love those. Yeah. Yeah, they're cool. That fun? Yeah. And casting is fun. Lost Wax casting. Brass, it's a fun process. Yeah, it looks bitching. Cost pretty minimal. Well, dude, this has been great. I yeah, appreciate you really coming cool. on. We uh, we 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 don't we never knew each other or really had spoke. We knew of each other, obviously. Um, yeah, but this was a I've great conversation. Felt in uh, high high regard, and quite frankly, if Art Morrison wasn't like a dad to me, I'd be on your wait list. Hey, oh, dude, no problem, man. We we, uh, we, re- had, we respect. I was going to ask, do. what's what's the next project with a roaster shop chassis? <laughs> 
Yeah, you know, I, I'm such a loyal bugger. You know what it is? It's the next project that uh, Matt Jones and Art Morrison say no to. Yeah. I'm crawling. <laughs> well, when they say no, we'll be there for you, man. You know what, no, we, <laughs> we can definitely appreciate that. I, I appreciate the loyalty, and we haven't come knocking on your door for that reason. Like, we know where you're at and what camp you're in, and and respect the loyalty and don't want to chase you down. So uh, a lot of props go out to that. And it's never been like I use Art Morrison because – you guys suck. I've always held you guys <laughs> in the highest regard. Oh, thank you. Quite frankly, I think when I originally reached out, you guys are like, we don't do no four wheel drive. Like, no yeah, back then we weren't. Stuff. Yeah, that wasn't our that wasn't our thing. But I don't blame you. The market wasn't there. I was I was uh, people thought I was nuts and still do. But now the market's there. For sure. I would like man. to drive one of your Bronco chassis though. I'm sure we if can work that out. If anyone yeah. on the West Coast builds a quality. Yeah, if anything ends up out there. Yeah, we had a uh, we had one of your uh, Broncos in the shop for some just general maintenance stuff that a guy had, and it was it was badass, man. Oh, cool! I didn't know yeah. you guys did that. Yeah, just every once in a while, you stumble across something that lands in the area that they need a Correct. oil Correct. change right. or yeah, it, it, air filled in the tire, just something. But uh, yeah, I drove it around, and it, very cool, man. Do That's a hell, you do a hell of a job with them. We've always been fans of yours. Love the work that you do, and honestly, it's you're you're an easy guy to look past the fact that you're using Morrison chassis because you do a phenomenal job of putting the whole package together, man. And regardless of whose chassis you're using, do a hell of a job. And props to you. We've uh, we're all fans and uh, love Thank what you, you do, man. So keep up the good work, dude. Yep. You guys too, and good luck with this new show. You got some Thank great you. content out already, and if uh, you got to have Rod Emery on, by the way. His cars don't really have chassis because they're little three five sixes. But yeah, we've got him on our hit list. Yeah, man. he's on the he's on the list. They're supposed to be reaching out. I think he's gonna have a great story. Yeah, Dear interesting friend, guy. One of, one of my uh, favorite humans. Awesome. Really yeah, cool. put in a good word then for yeah. us because Rod's got a. From what we know, he's got a very cool history, very cool background. I don't know him and personally. He's looking up some very cool things you would never anticipate because they're outside of his core competency. He's brewing up right now. I'll let him disclose and get deeper with you. Sweet. He's done some really cool stuff in the automotive community right now. I would look forward to that. Yeah, I'm pretty yeah. pumped about all the Miatas that he's coming out with. Um, yeah. I heard yeah. he's doing a lot of yeah. like hand-shaped Miata grills and fenders and bumpers. Way, it's going to be pretty way, badass. Way to get out in front of that one, Phil. Yeah, good job. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I think you meant PT Cruisers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my bad, my bad. Oh, wait, okay, well, one last thing before we go. I yeah, know this sure. has happened to you guys. You know when you're driving and like one of your crazy customs is badass, it's timeless, you come up to a stoplight. What happens every time the person in the faux wood paneled bonus chrome trim cruiser pulls up next to you? And you have to do everything in your spirit to return the thumbs up. Yeah. Like, yeah, we're part of the same tribe, yeah, buddy. You're, yeah. Every time. Yeah. Dude, he's driving a hot rig. Ride, you're you know? like, hey, Josh, what's up, buddy? <laughs> <laughs> I'm always like, um, thank you. Yeah, yeah, I, we're good. yeah. I appreciate it. Yeah. Usually, the prowler guy. The prowler is the one that's going to go. That's going to meet you in traffic. That's going to go all the way out, like the motorcycle two fingers. Oh yeah, down. he's doing the. He's gonna, <laughs> hey, yeah, yeah, street rod, dude, street rod. Yeah, all right. Yeah. Uh, well, Gotta if you're it. ever out in the Chicago area, come by and see us, and we're going to hook you, look you up, the next time we're out there in uh, California. Eh? Perfect. And I, I'll, I guess I'll see you in Vegas this fall. Yeah, we'll, we'll be, be there, there, man. Be there. I'm going to bring the Benz this year. That, oh, really? That year, like a car. Yeah, you guys will dig it. Sweet, Look forward man. to seeing it. Yeah, love to check it out. All right, cool. Appreciate reach out. it, All right, Jonathan. Man. Thanks, dude. Love. Take see care. Bye. Bye-bye. Uh, all right, it's time for the Glove Box, where we tell you about some cool new gear, guns, EDC shit, whiskey, and other stuff that we're into. This In the Glove Box segment is brought to you by none other than Bear Brakes. Bear brakes, I mean, we've we've done this several times. Really, it kind of sounds like we're lying, but bear brakes is the shit. It just works, man. Yeah. It just works and works good. Every uh, every chassis that gets ordered with brakes gets bear brakes. Every car we every build, car we build gets bear brakes. Yeah. Dude, they're doing some cool stuff too. They did uh some cool eleven inch stuff for us since you know we've got the uh trans am on the new spec chassis and uh i was adamant about running 15 inch wheels on that so rick put together a pretty cool little kit for a uh 
uh, C6 rear hub, like a floater uh, yeah. housing in with an 11 inch brake. And uh, yeah, looking forward to getting that on the road, man. I've been impressed with uh, the stopping power of their 11 inch stuff on up to the 14 inch stuff. They can pretty much make anything four piston, six piston, 11 inch, 14 inch. It all works and it all works. 15 great. inch on the OBS stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They had to have some badass borderline obnoxious brakes on that truck with the big 22s and 24s. So they, uh, they killed brakes. it with some cool anodized colors and uh, some pre 80s throwback stuff. Um, Border- so they go to guys for one off as well. Borderline obnoxious until you put 24s on the back. And then, yeah, then they look like 11. And it's dwarfed. <laughs> but uh, Bear Brakes is on the very short list of companies that you can never say anything bad about, and everything just works. Uh, and the customer service is, is beyond anything that you could ever expect. So great company, it's continuing to do great things. Um, more companies should strive to do what Bear Brakes does. Absolutely. Uh, to learn more about Bear Brakes, go to B-A-E-R.com. You can also call us at the Roadster Shop and talk to any of the sales guys if you have any more questions. Well, we, we still haven't decided what we're going to do on the cocktail judging competition. I didn't know that we needed to decide. I thought it was just like an unspoken thing. What do you mean? It's, no, it's, it's between it second and third place for you two. How is it unspoken? You can't just be like, oh, yeah, I did it, and then just assume the win. It hasn't been judged oh, on figured, by anybody. Yeah, I figured it was just one of those, like, we just don't need to talk about it. I got to be honest, guys. I spent a week in Florida and had a lot of uh, Stillhouse cherry with uh, lemonade and agave, and I'm pretty sure that's the winner. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Man. That's awesome, Phil. That's, a, that's super I think, cool. I think we've got to figure out a way to get. <laughs> Thank you. We've. <laughs> We've got to get 10. I was here for a week and I didn't have enough time to make one of your fucking cocktails. So. Yeah. Where am I? Should brush up on your uh, bartending skills then. Nor is there a Whole Foods or any other type of that's special. <laughs> hey, that's the last time I treat you two fuckers to nice things. Okay? I don't believe that. I'll tell you what. Let's redo, <laughs> let's redo it and let me grab just something. I'll get like, I mean, whatever, Sprite, ginger ale. Just... Ah, uh, mixer. And I'll just I mix it. Angry I'll just, dude, I'll literally just so take it's gonna be dude, it's it's gonna be fucking badass. So what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take that and then I'm gonna take the stillhouse whiskey and I'm gonna just pour it in a glass. No, what we're gonna do is we're gonna figure out how to get And I'm gonna tell you that I created a cocktail. We're gonna for get you. some employees to judge it. We're gonna remake the drinks. Okay. And we're gonna have the employees judge it. We gotta figure out how though. And we can't make drinks for everybody. No, especially the way that my drink is created. Yes. That's for a select few. There's a lot of a lot of flair. A lot of flair to your drink. Yeah. That's now, what it, it takes. It, ta- yeah. it, it tasted great. Uh, but it's, it's it's good. It's not bad. Yeah. I don't know that I want to shoot it. I'm not like much of a shooter. I could sip this. It's a shot you can sip. Well, it tastes good. Yeah. Check out Stillhouse. I've got, I've got some uh some text messages and some and some uh, conversation at some shows about people picking up some Stillhouse and trying it. And they're actually, it's the black bourbon uh, readily available in liquor stores. That was the one I had a hard time tracking down. I think it's a little bit more difficult to find than the flavored ones, but the Is black it? bourbon shit's good. So good. Yeah. What do we have in our pockets, Phil? Since you are remote, you go first. Let's see what you got in your board shorts yeah. pockets over there. I legit am wearing board shorts. Of course you are. So. I want to see a conch shell. Yeah, no dice on that. I do have a pair of fishing pliers. I've been rocking nonstop. Look at you. Yeah. Have you caught any Some, fish down there? Uh, uh, I have an eight-year-old son, um, so fishing is not really fishing. It is... Baiting hooks, taking things off of hooks, re-putting hooks on lines, untangling lines. Hey, you and then five minutes later, we're hey, done. Hey, you didn't fuck up those nice fishing rods I got down there, did you? No, I use the shitty ones. Yeah. You're good. <laughs> that new fucking little carbon ones are a fucking ripper, man. Is it? I treated myself to a nice fishing rod. Oh. My one at home got snapped in half by some children. 
<laughs> so it's, it's, you can't. You just can't have nice things. You can't have nice yeah. things. Yeah. We were rocking the Kmart special still. Uh, Cam actually caught two fish with no bait, just a hook. Damn. Wow. He was trying to catch tarpon, couldn't land it. Threw a couple of shrimp out, fished all the, uh, the the shrimp right off. And then he's like, Dad, I'm just going to drop this in and see what happens. Two times in a row, just a hook, landed a couple little snapper on just a hook. Hmm. That's wild. Tasty little hook. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So, but roll, yeah, been roll rocking roll these, uh, pro. the old Florida staple, little fishing players. Um, and then, uh, I wish I had a knife because I was out on the old uh, sea dew and ran over uh, a little bit of a uh, lobster trap line that was floating. Um, spent about 15, 20 minutes uh, with the mask and snorkel underwater trying to get it out of the prop shaft. Didn't have a knife on me. Need to get a, uh, a daily carry down here. Um, yeah, racked my fingers quite a bit. Uh, eventually got it out. Thought we were going to be uh, stranded out at sea for a while, but uh, we made it happen. Um, went back to the boat and uh, had this little guy sitting in the boat. This is, uh, I believe, your purchase. But yeah. Uh, yeah, picked that boy up. A little fucking nasty boy. A little yeah. bench made. <laughs> Little bench made fixed blade with a leather sheath. I uh, was carrying that on the boat, but not on the jet ski where uh, where I needed it. So, yeah, that's a cool. That's like that? the right fixed blade side size. It's like a so you can carry it without yeah two two being obnoxious blade. with it. Yeah. Yep, that's that's about it in the pockets. What do you got, Jer? Dude, it's coincidentally, it's just fixed blade night tonight because i am rocking the half face blade my headphones caught over here um dude this such a killer killer blade courtesy of matt saxton love that that little deal got a roadster shop logo engraved in it got the camo cerakote on it half face blades yeah sharp Sharp motherfucker right there. Sweet knife. Yeah, cool little sheath. Tough to carry. I find that if you slide, rather than trying to put the, you know, it's a plastic, uh, a plastic sheath. But if you, if you just pocket that, it carries better than trying to put it on like a belt loop. Hmm. Like I want to carry a fixed blade, and you're a badass if you carry a fixed blade, but it's just not. The most practical thing. You need to go. You need to it's, figure out how to hey, go sideways on it's, sideways. Pull. Phil, it's cool. I mean, you I get the compliment that I'm a fucking badass. It's it's cool. You could have just said it. Like, <laughs> Glad you read through that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I cut right like to the substance of that one. Thank you for that. Yeah, I'm um, glad. So yeah, there's that, and uh, <laughs> that's about it. And uh, yeah, keys, money clip, got the wall. I've been doing a little research looking around for the wall. I started looking at like, there's so many gimmicky wallets, right? I found this thing that's like almost like a magnet that closes up. Have you seen that one? Yep. But then I'm like, dude, you're around Still metal shavings, big. metal dust all day. That thing's like my phone speaker is always loaded with metal shavings. That right. thing's just going to be a mess. So I found myself going back to, I'm back on Shinola's website. That's the one I'm, I'm rocking kind of viewing the, the traditional dad. I think I'm going to go for a new dad wallet. Really? Yeah. I think that's where I'm at. I think you can pull decision right there. You can yeah. pull it off, but it's got to be thin. It has to be made of like nothing. Nylon woven polymers. Yeah. Yeah. What are they calling it? Carlson does it with the leather, you know, where he uh, peels all the back. He's got that wicked little machine he's it's always talking about. Gathed or scathed. Yeah, he just like says words. Yeah. You know? And I'm like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, that's yeah, for Sounds sure. Legit. Yeah. Definitely Makes do the leather that, thinner. Yeah. Definitely do that. Yes, yes, gave it. So yeah, I might scalve. I think scalve. it's I think it's an L. There might, I don't know if it's silent or what. It's a silent L. Yeah. Scalve. Scalve. Scave. Scalve. Scave. So yeah. yeah. That's that's all I got, man. I okay. am uh, Did Jared tell you the story about my wallet and uh, my other doppelganger? No. <laughs> this is ridiculous. What? <laughs> Fucking Phil. <laughs> this look alikes. So uh, I had a, what was her name? Uh, 
Florida Keys Dockside Fuel come to the house to uh, fill up the boat. And dude starts talking to me and I'm like instantly, I'm trying to get a picture because he kind of like sort of really looks exactly like me. Exactly looks like <laughs> So I was going to send you guys a pic. Gives me the bill. I pull out my wallet, give him my credit card. He goes, oh, dude, fucking awesome wallet. Pulls out the same one. He goes, yeah, I was struggling for a while. I got the same shitty $15 Amazon wallet. Best wallet I've ever had. Like, I was kind of in the same boat. Like, I bought three or four of them. Like, it is an off-brand, like, the exact same wallet. Nobody's ever heard of it. Andy looks identical to me. Solid-looking dude. Had the same wallet. I just... We, we yeah, ran into it. I don't know where I'm going with the story, but it was you should have cool. got You should have got a picture of both of you next to each other yeah. holding up the same so wallet. For, for those who don't know, take a good look at Phil and just... Lock it in your memory. And, and you when will, you walk around you on that. a daily basis. We saw him today. Yeah, you will see. <laughs> on a, a, You're going to see at least two Phil lookalike doppelgangers a day. We go. To, we treated ourselves today. We, you know, we, it was a late night last night. We didn't feel like going to the gym today, so we grabbed some lunch. I'm like, dude, we're treating ourselves to some smoothies. Yep. Because we were over in that neck of the woods. So we're paying. And I say, hey, Josh, don't you want to... Uh, get phil something grab grab phil's too <laughs> so we look over there this fucking phil clone yeah standing just, in line right behind us if you like you're set you're if you can lock phil's face in your memory though you will be amazed at how many times you see him out in the wild oh, all yeah. over the place we have a full there's a lot of really really good looking dudes yeah. out there I don't know we've got that's one you, way of looking at it what do you think we're yep. up to how many hundred i've got like 130 something in my phone yeah it, we might have to make that a segment. <laughs> Phil's, yeah, we found, yeah. yeah. We got to come up with a name. Yeah, we got to think of something clever. Yeah. Phil, Phil's finds. Phil. Can you guys come up with a jingle, maybe? Yeah, yeah, I think yeah. we could. Phil, <laughs> there he is. There he is again. There's another Phil. Phil, hey. it's Phil. It looks just like Phil. There's Phil. There's another Phil. Oh, Phil, Phil. <laughs> Everywhere you look is Phil. Phil. <laughs> It's a horrible jingle. This is the worst right. jingle I've ever heard. Was, we're going to work on that one. Yeah, it was just no time. <laughs> uh, oh, see, for me, I've got a uh, standard run, still rocking the ridge. Uh, knife, I'm... Uh, I always forget. Is this the uh, bug out or the bailout? What's bug the out. one with the aluminum in the... Yep. Yeah, that's the, I thought it was the bug out. I think it's the bug out. I'm going to look it up. I, I have them both, and I regularly confuse the two of them as well. I thought that was the plastic guy, but that's a cool little blade. I think the smaller one's the bailout, the bigger one's the bug out. Oh, that's the bailout. Mm -hmm. That one's the bailout. Like Tom, I said, Tonto blade. Yep. Uh, so, yeah. What did I say it was? Benchmade. The bailout? Yeah. Have you thought about um, seracoding the uh, scales a different color yet? No, I haven't because I purchased the knife because of the color of the scales, and that's a good looking color. It's not a but bad looking green. color, man. I don't mind green. You got a thing with green? Hmm. Yeah, Phil's anti green, but dude, we totally overlooked. This is a if you don't have this is a great knife. I know Phil, you rock yours, and the thinness and the I mean, it's just all around. I find myself going back to it over and over. Yeah, I do as well. It's probably my favorite knife in my collection. Dude, we we, we blew past. Maybe it's not in the pocket at the moment, but it will be. But, oh, yeah. Uh, these cool-ass flasks. Jonathan, Jonathan, Jonathan really, Ward sent these he, over. He stepped it up. Look at time. these guys. And cool, distressed leather. Phil, which one do you want? What I don't know how right now? how you do that. But what the, color do you the, want? This, the one that's not fucked up. Dude, check out the stitching on the back. Oh, Jerry put his balls on all three of them. So which one do you want? <laughs> yeah, so they're mine. Jerry one's not stained. <laughs> I like how we started off the interview with since you guys didn't send me a care package. Yeah, because I we know. failed to do that. We're work. We're working on that properly. It's, we're, now we're, it's it's honestly just become like. It's embarrassing. It's like a slap in the face. Yeah, it's difficult to even start these. I know. 
podcast. I just wanted to crawl under the table. I hope Ironclad is listening. Yeah. Uh, these are really cool. Which one would you like? Are they different colors? I can't see too well. Yeah, yeah they're, they're all different, different colors. colors. I like this guy. I like, yeah, I, like the, uh, I like the stitch work on the back, the contrast on the stitching. You got like a orange thread against this kind of olive colored uh, distressed leather. They're cool. Phil, you get the black one because I'm taking this one. Yeah, you get whatever the hell we don't want. I, I, think, I, I think I want this one. Well, you can't have that one. That one's mine. Hmm. Hmm. And honestly, like, I, I'd, I'd appreciate you if you just quit fucking with it. <laughs> with your <laughs> grubby little fingers. Uh, just put that down. Now, drinking. What are we drinking? A Again, different. We, yeah, we're different. drinking something that this is uh, totally different than what we're used to pouring. You guys are fucking with the scotch tonight, huh? Yeah, we are. This, uh, Phil missed out on this. This was also gifted from Jonathan Ward. Uh, he's a scotch guy. I I dabbled with some scotch a little bit before getting into bourbon, and uh, I'm not real knowledgeable on it. So, uh, yeah, and I... Josh sounds like he's dying over there. Excuse me. Uh, it, is that old? Is that Father Time kicking in? <laughs> I don't even know how to pronounce. Uh, I don't even know how you'd pronounce this. Kaul Ila. Is that how you would say that? Do you think? I'm looking up the pronunciation right yeah. now. <laughs> so it's a 12 year, is Isle. Uh, Cole, any, it's Cole. Cole Ila. Cole Ila. Cole Ila. Cole Ila. Age 12 years. Ile single malt Scotch whiskey, and anybody that's a Scotch fan is probably just. A twelve-year not cold gonna Ila. like me murdering murdering this. It was interesting, man. Coming from drinking regularly, drinking bourbon, the the flavor palette there, the it's different. There's a lot going on, man. You taste initially, it's it's smooth. It's kind of like thin, but it's smoky, leathery, spicy, all sorts of things. There's like a like a little party going on in your mouth there two sips in once you once you realize that this is what you're drinking and it, that that flavor kind of subsides a little bit i i enjoyed it i enjoyed it, drinking the scotch tonight it was good it was cool cool to drink it's interesting that they say right there on the bottle that it is a hidden gem amongst islay's distilleries since 1846 and not easy to find so when they put not easy to find right there on the label hmm I'd assume that they're not they're not bluffing. It's probably not easy, easy to, find. to find. Do they have expensive in parentheses? <laughs> Let's see. Uh, yeah, a lot of stuff I just don't know about. Um, I'm a rookie when it comes to the scotch. So I don't, I mean, I don't even know what the proof is. I feel like we got to get Chris Gray on here to we uh, add some of the scotch for us. We should. I enjoyed it, though. It was cool to mix it up. Um, it's interesting when you just look at the, you know, when you talk about it being thin, Josh, you look at it like just in the bottle. You can, yeah. That, I'm, I don't know why on, on whiskeys and scotches, I'm, the viscosity is a big thing to me. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, that's like mobile and, one, synthetic. And not, not that one's... <laughs> That's one's worse than the other. It's just something that you pick up on as you're drinking more and more. Um, <clears throat> I mean, I, I look at Blanton's is very is very thin like that, um, and you get some of the you know, you know it's when you get into Pappy stuff and even your uh, like Weller Twelve and stuff, and it's a little thicker, it's yeah, a little more a syrupy, syrupy, yeah, if you will. Uh, but it was that was good. I, I was surprised uh, that you that you that you went there. I know you're you're you have traditionally not been a big Scotch guy. Um, yep. Yeah, I've got a handful of them in the collection. Yeah. Oban, uh, ten year, I think it is. Yeah. Um, yeah, I got. A, I've got a few. They are good, but I find that my obsession with bourbon and my compulsive bourbon buying habit, it's not healthy to Mix. begin another right hobby. Yeah, because if I get into scotch and I get into rum and I get into like micro brewery beers. There's just not enough room for them in the house, I think is what the problem is going to be. Well, <laughs> super nice gift of Jonathan to send that prior to. Um, we were able to drink the same same scotch that he was drinking. Yeah, um, and I will good. tell you, the 12-year the, the Cole Ila 
is uh, if you're a scotch guy or not a scotch guy, if you're going to try some scotch, try it. Get it. It's, it's really, really good. Get it. We don't know enough about it to say, like, really yeah. anything else, but it, it was good. Uh, I'm going to chime in a little bit oh, yeah. on Phil's what drink. I'm drinking here. What are you drinking? I am uh, going with the Florida Keys uh, Papa's Pilar. That's the silver the top? Staple. <laughs> Staple in the uh, the household when we're down here. Um, I don't drink rum unless I'm uh, down in Florida, and then when here, rum on the rocks. That's uh, that's what we go to. Jerry, you've been there as well. Josh, you've oh, been yeah. down here, and we've killed many of uh, many of bottles. Um, yeah, don't yeah. drink that much bourbon on vacation. Drink a lot of rum down here, and Papa's Pilar is by far uh, my favorite. Never drank rum straight. Didn't know there was good rum until I had this. There's probably a lot better rum, but this is uh, this is our go-to, and I'm a huge fan. Been killing it. Oh, that stuff is a absolute game changer. I restrict myself to only drinking it down there because it I will crush it if I drink really? it at home. So I use it. As it's a home. bottle per vacation. Yeah, yeah, it is. We've got we keep all the bottles, keep the tops because they have these really cool. Uh, threaded knurled kind of tops that have like a little compass kind of thing yeah. on very you know nautical and there's got to be 60 to 70 tops and bottles that we just we just kept we just what's the hammered under like, one stone yeah, just line them up what's the difference between the red and the silver top so the red is the sherry cask that's yes. one i've got i like it yeah and they yep. do a lot of them. There's another one. There's one. There's a light rum, and then there's one down here that you must have got. It's in like a leather sheath. It's like a yeah. special edition. I was debating cracking that, but then there was a regular bottle, so I just yeah. killed that. Yeah, there. Every once in a while, they drop something. I don't know. That was another like cognac barrel or something like that. But yeah, the rum, like it sounds off-putting because you're so used to just like Bacardi, you know? Yeah. I guess, pe- yeah, there's probably plenty of people who are into rum. I mean, rum's obviously a thing, but, man, that stuff, you pour it just on the rocks, and you can drink it. I mean, it's it's just easy. You don't have to make a cocktail. Right. It's got, like, a, uh, almost like a brown sugar. It's like a sweeter bourbon. Taste to it. Yeah. yeah. It's good. It takes a minute, like, uh, takes, I think people are usually caught a little off guard when you just pour them, like, just straight fucking rum. Right. But once you get past that initial glass, because it's got a little kick to it, you get used to it, and nothing better. Good, good stuff. Pick up some Papa's Pilar if you see it. Absolutely. Most, well, most liquor stores. Well, Ernest Hemingway there. brand, yeah. Yeah. Down in Key West is the distillery. Is it really? Yeah. It I, is. I, yeah, I've been, yep. in, I've been into the distillery. It's pretty cool. Like Phil said, they've got the blonde uh, light rum, which is good for, like, How's mixing. the blonde? Not something you want to like. You're not gonna. It's a good I, mixer. I yeah, I don't drink it straight. But if you're making some kind of like tropical cocktail, man, it's choice. Sweet, good stuff. Uh, next up, it's time for the Roadster Shop Hall of Fame. This is a segment where we take a few minutes to talk about some of our favorite vehicle builds, the iconic builds or vehicles that were just a ton of fun for the Roadster Shop team to create. Yes, Phil. Did we get Amari King to announce this yet? Is he still around? Uh, I think he was one and done, but that was the yeah. Chevy Silverado. It's a Chevy Silverado. Yeah. yeah, that was good. That was that was that was, was Gatlinburg. That's right, Gatlinburg. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, your, your uncle in Gatlinburg. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so, tell the listeners a little bit about how. Well, first, how did the Chevy Colorado? come about it was a uh gm dollar car program so something that they're not doing anymore i think they cut that out uh several years back. years ago yeah. yeah but uh you know most of the oems uh you typically the big three would offer a dollar car program to builders so you submit a rendering and for one dollar they provide you a brand new off the showroom floor. Just like that. GM, right Ford, you name it, vehicle. So we came up with this concept to take a Chevy Colorado, 
which was uh, 2015. I think that was probably right. That was the, the first they, year they came out. So uh, yeah, yeah, cool little truck. I mean, at the time they had a really cool look. There hadn't been uh, like a small. What would what, you call it? It's not even mid mid size. Mid size. Mid size pickup truck. In Besides the, the Ridge Line. Which is a Honda product. Right. Yeah. yeah. So we decided because this is what we do that we're not going to just put like a lift kit on it you're going to go from there or some some vinyl or some wheels to there because that's what most people do it's generally the dollar car program was always kind of a opportunity to submit a very simple rendering get a car for free get some sponsors and throw some wheels tires and a lowering kit or a lift kit and a vinyl package and bam after the SEMA show, you've got yourself a brand new car for one dollar. And there you've got a cab with the front end cut off of it. Yeah. We decided to throw everything that GM did out the window and kind of take the general styling of the truck and then turn it up to like a 19. Yeah. Yeah. So this well past 10, 11, 12. This was a hell of a project, man. Uh it was just great teamwork, an awesome concept, crazy short time frame that we did this on. So I think we started this project, um, started actual fabrication in September. No way. Yeah, I want to say. Really? Yeah. We didn't get the truck until September. I think yeah. we actually started the chassis before we got the truck. We got the CAD stuff so, from GM before we got the truck, right? Yeah. Yeah. We got a uh, whole CAD model of the truck from GM and uh, this was something that Mike kind of went wild on and uh, me and Mike worked pretty close on coming up with the concept for a actual functional pre-runner. I mean, this was legitimate luxury pre-runner, basically, you know, a damn trophy truck um, that we built out of a brand new <laughs> Chevy Colorado. So. We did it a little differently within roadster shop fashion. I mean, that's not the background that we come from, but uh, from an engineering standpoint, fabrication standpoint, knowledge standpoint, I mean, we've got it all to pull this off. So unlike a traditional like full tube chassis or just clipping in like a front subframe and some Devers rear leafs, we built traditional frame rails just like we would a roadster shop chassis. So we designed this whole thing uh, in SolidWorks, Mike just crushed it on this design, and then uh, we just went after it, man. The, as soon as the truck showed up, it was just all the perfect uh, like players, you know, on the team. We had Joe just crushing it on the tube work for the roll cage. Henry uh, did some crazy bedsides for it. Everything it was unique to that world because there was no fiberglass. You know anything because just from a time standpoint you didn't have time i mean we didn't have time to like make molds i mean we didn't even as you can see in this like picture, three months yeah we were waiting on shocks and springs so we took some models and just laser cut some profiles to put things in place just so we can move forward um but just crazy i mean it was like motors set way back whole, i love that hood love whole, that hood whole the bed HD floors inspired fabricated yeah hood's got a just a bitch and scoop fabbed in it the zr2 colorado has a very similar looking hood now based off of what we did so it's uh, interestingly enough with the chevy stuff we've done a few of these dollar cars and oddly enough i don't want i'm not going to state claim to, i'm not going to say this is like definitively that gm stole our styling ideas but GM inspired by probably was inspired by some of those styling ideas because like the RSV we did that extractor kind of hood where we you know dumped the made those two little scoops dude like two years later bam you've got that exact hood out of GM on the new trucks like Phil said you get the ZR2 that's very similar to this hood scoop which I mean, is cool whether they did or didn't who knows but uh yeah, this wasn't built. It's more impressive to just look at this stuff and be like, yeah, it was kind of something we may or may not have had a hand in. Yeah. Turn into a production piece. It was pretty badass. 
But looking back at this, I mean, it's mind blowing that we accomplished this much in such a short period of time and really did it to a high level. This wasn't what you would call like a SEMA vehicle. I mean, there was nothing scabbed together, um, just crazy over the top fabrication loaded with the best of the best machine parts and fabrication. This is actually where we first connected with Camberg. Um, I think we used one of their housings out back, or at least it was their, uh, I know we used their snouts up front on the spindles, used all their bearings, and uh, yeah, man, it was wild. Big uh, cubic inch, 500 inch LS motor, tall deck, setback, sidewinder shifter, cutting brake, BFG project tires. Mm. Projects are... Dude, just, I mean... That separates the men from the boys yeah. right there. That's the coolest looking tire I think ever built. Oh, it's bad, man. I tried to get some for my truck. I don't think you want to drive them on the street. Yeah, I know. That's what I've been told. But, but uh, yeah, I mean, it was fun. I, this was one of the... I mean, probably one of the last projects I was actually physically working on. Right, we, got uh, a, we got a few pictures of yeah, you Yeah, you here. might see me. The whole... The front fenders, there I am. Yeah. And shape the... The flares, the wheel openings, the whole front fascia. Look at that guy, man. Damn. Yeah, look at you. So, mm -hmm. yeah, that was uh, where I just walked away from my skill set and decided that I'm just going to manage a company instead of fabricate sweet shit. Um, but, yeah, I had a lot of fun building it and uh, a lot of fun using it. We took it to SEMA, and immediately after SEMA, I mean, the whole point of this truck is that we intended to just rip this thing in the dunes man we want to take it out to glamis put it through the paces use it take it to silver lake up by us and just punish it have some fun with it had a lot of horsepower tons of travel and immediately after the sema show i mean we couldn't wait for the show to be over i think it ended up in the battle of the builders and uh after that we went right out to what is it, the Dumont Dunes, Phil? Was it out there? In, uh... No, Dumont's in Pismo. It was somewhere right outside of uh, Vegas, like our south Dude, of look Vegas. At look at that workmanship up front. Damn. It's crazy. How about that? Uh, it's all Henry's work there. No, that's my handy. We go together and whatnot. Henry was out back. That's... Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I think uh, within like the first probably five to seven minutes we were out there, we were looking for jumps and we full send it. Oh, yeah. We were just fucking launching the thing, man. Just had some crazy, you know, you had some bulls out there. We're just, I mean, absolutely punishing the truck, just having a fucking blast with it. And it is brand new. I mean, we drove it, made a few laps, you know, around the shop, uh, you know, the, the typical little route there. Had it, you know, sorted enough that the, you know, motor trans suspension were, were good to go and just fucking ripped it out there and had a blast doing it. And it's, uh, dude, it's funny that I don't know who the guy is, but this truck, it cannot, we'll, we'll pause right there, go back to the roll cage in the <laughs> rear. So this truck cannot appear on the World Wide Web, the internet, or the social media ever. Without that pre-run, what the fuck is the guy's name, Phil? It's some pre-runner uh, social uh, media page. I think it's, it's pre-runner asshole is his name. Yeah, maybe it, the truck. I could be wrong. The name Roadster Shop Colorado can't be mentioned without this guy publicly having a fucking shit fit that you can't sit in the back seat. Every single time a picture surfaces of this oh, truck, gets in. there is that guy to, oh, yeah, pretty cool, unless you're two foot fucking one and going to try to sit in the fucking back seat and break your fucking legs, wrists, and head because you can't sit in the fucking back seat. I'm like, dude, what are you fucking talking about? Like, I have no idea what the guy is trying to... What he's saying, he's, he's unhappy. Yeah, he can, about it. He's very. No, he can sit. He can sit in mom's basement, no problem, and just Monday yeah, morning quarterback that fucker all day long. Yeah, they probably don't have any like three inch Fox coilovers, or there's no five hundred inch RHS Not tall when he's deck eating mom's meatloaf. No, no thirty five <laughs> inch <laughs> BFG projects or thirty sevens. Thirty seven. Yeah, in mom's basement, there's probably what do they got? down there you think it's a sega genesis or you think he's got playstation 2 i think he's a huge sonic the hedgehog fan like, you think it's just yeah so 
Could be traditional Sega Nintendo. Ah, just no, straight up Zelda. No, that's a Sega guy. Yeah, yeah. Sega one. I would all. say he's playing Ivan Stewart uh, Iron Man, but that's a disgrace to the game. No, that's yeah, a disgrace to the yeah. game. No, you're too bad at. That's if Sega. he was playing that, he'd just be sitting there motherfucking the game the whole time. Sega Sega guys are a different. That's a different breed. It is. Yeah. But at any rate, he can go fuck himself. <laughs> yeah, he can go fuck himself. <laughs> Uh, because we took, I'm glad we got there. Glad yeah. we got there. It took a while to get there, but every time, I mean, I see a lot of shit on social media. This guy, it's like, dude, what the fuck is every single fucking time? But we took it out there. My old man was sitting in the fucking back seat. It was, you know, five, nine, whatever. Just fucking ripping through the desert, launching this thing, catching just ripper fucking air. Had a blast with it. And, uh, Ended up finding uh, a dude reached out to us from NFAB at the time who just had to have the truck. And we did not want to part with it. But, uh, you know, it's we're not in the business of collecting cars. We build them to sell them or for customers. So we we let it go. And it sits in his collection. Um, it's the pride of his collection from what I understand. And it's not something that he takes off-road or regularly uses in the dirt or the sand which that's up to him man he owns it he can do whatever he wants but uh we had a fucking blast building it very cool to see what the team could do all working together short period of time great engineering great organization and yeah there you have i found this was sitting on my dad keep Next to my monitor because it's such a bitch and it's gonna be a great addition to the yeah uh, such a bitch and little logo that Chris Gray designed. It was easy to spin off of the color rad. Oh, we that's gonna that that's gonna make there. its way into the into the studio. It will. But yeah, that's one of the that's that's one of the dark horses, man. One of the forgotten kind of builds. But I looking was, back, I never really go back and dig through these pictures. But shit, man, looking at the the amount of work that went into that in that short amount of time it's, it's mind blowing i was yeah i was looking through today when we were prepping for this and i was like holy shit yeah this was this is one that's definitely worthy of the roadster shop hall of fame for sure damn i think my favorite uh as we got started there was a handful of the uh like legit off-road pre-runner guys Followed on Facebook, and there was a couple of comments like, you know, we're going to check this out. We're interested in following this. Let's see where this goes. And then we started showing like pictures of like the suspension cycling through full droop, full compression. And I think Kibby Tech posted something like, it was like a one liner. I was like, yeah, that's legit. I'm like, all right, yep, yeah, we've made it. That's badass. We got recognition from the guys who like we respect and the dudes we look up to were were blown away by it so i think that was pretty awesome that is cool yeah like you said when the, when the ogs are are giving you the the stamp of approval that's that's really fucking cool yeah even the interior was bitching man and it's it's a different ball game when you're working around like brand new truck stuff which obviously we did away with the majority of it but man it's just this one it, it actually kind of blows my mind that we did this now that I'm looking back on it. I didn't know it was such a tight deadline. I had no idea. Yeah, the deadline was insane. I think we built the entire chassis almost before we had the actual truck. Yeah. It was just kind of a credit to GM and like the CAD program through SEMA that we were able to get all that data and like design everything off of that. So... Very cool project. Hell of a lot of fun. It's definitely one deserving, for sure. It is. It's cool to look back on it. It's, it's, a, it's a learning experience, too. I feel like I'd love to do another kind of pre-runner type I'm sure Phil vehicle. would love to do that as well. Oh, I know. He talks about it all the time. He's always saying that we should do something like that. And when we do, I think we've learned. I mean, we've learned a lot, and I've got some ideas for something that <laughs> I'd love to put together at some point here in the near future. So we'll see. Are we building a pre-runner Miata? I don't. I don't know if the track. The problem with that, I don't think the travel. It's not the track, can exceed, but it's the wheelbase. Yeah, I don't think the travel can exceed the wheelbase. 
is the problem. <laughs> yeah. Like that's where you run into there's yeah, it's a tough if you trade off. If you've got there. two 37 inch overall diameter they're touch, tires. They're touching each other. Right. <laughs> right. And the name is there. We call it the off roadster. Yeah. Money. Hmm. You've got what, 84, 84 inches of. You got 84 inches of wheel wheels. Wheelbase and Let's travel. Say you put 84 Let's say, inches yeah. of tires. <laughs> right. Yeah, you put 35s on that thing. Even 35, I mean, you're touching. Yeah, you're. Yeah. It's like a fucking roller skate. And I mean, ultimately, I mean, you're not going to fuck with a gentleman's car like that. No, that car. Those are more collectors. Right. I mean, right. ask Phil. He's got seven of them. Right. That, that car belongs, you know, hitting the apexes on Laguna Seca, not in the desert. <laughs> or at Ron Fellow's driving suck. school. I'm just going to be honest with you. Those <laughs> cars absolutely <laughs> suck. Hey, Phil. Phil doesn't Solid think so. Yeah. <laughs> oh. uh, all right. Well. Color, yep. Colorado and, and Colorado and Miata doesn't even need to be talked about no, in the same not, sentence. Absolutely not. But that'll do it for the Hall of Fame. Thanks for listening to Oil & Whiskey with the Roadster Shop, an ironclad original. If you like the show, be sure to leave us a rating and review. Thanks again to our guest, Jonathan Ward. We'll see you again next week. <laughs>